that was you hate crime law. We're talking about that properly. We yes. did talk about that a little bit it's during a really the week. It's really interesting subject yeah. as well. Uh, Peter, I hope the show goes very well indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your company today. I wish you a very happy Easter. Dr. Rene, will you be back tomorrow? I will. Well, that's kind. Just uh, before I pop to Spain. <laughs> right, of course you're going to Spain. We'll so both... She's on one of her rare visits to the UK. <laughs> I know. She's like royalty, this one. She just pops in, you know, graces us with her with her. She doesn't carry cash either. Anyway, we need to go. We'll be back tomorrow from 7 o'clock. Do join us then for weekend breakfast. Hope you have a great day. Peter Caldwell is up next here on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Never mind the ballot. A brand new look at all things politics from the sun with me, Harry Cole. Watch my big end of the week with no stone unturned. Every Thursday evening, exclusively with the sun. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah, Quite yeah, right, yeah. too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, had lots of racism in it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter. Find me, Vanessa Phelps, every weekday at 4 p.m., only on talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, a very good morning. I'm Peter Cardwell. You're very welcome. Sorry, I've just got a frog in my throat. I'll tell you what it is. I've been eating some of these chocolate eggs uh, from... Excuse me, I'm just going to have to cough for a second. <coughs> some of the chocolate eggs that uh, Renee and Dr. David have been leaving, so apologies for that. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. I'm here between 9 and 1 o'clock, and indeed tomorrow between 10 and 1. And then on Monday between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. I'm filling in for Ian Collins on Bank Holiday Monday. Very happy Easter I will uh, to you, Easter weekend anyway. Tomorrow, of course, is Easter Day, and uh, we will be reflecting that within the programme, of course. Very, very important to many of the uh, Christians and people who celebrate Easter who watch and listen to the show. So happy Easter to you uh, for tomorrow, of course, Easter Day. Lots to talk about on the programme today. We're asking why Labour is more trusted on defence than the Conservatives. A poll has revealed that voters now associate Conservatives with cutting military spending rather than increasing it. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the DUP leader in uh, Northern Ireland, political earthquake there. He has been uh, d he has been suspended from the DUP and indeed charged on rape charges. We're not going to get into that because, well, we will a little bit, but that is, of course, uh, something which is an active court proceeding, but uh, major, major implications for what is happening in politics in Northern Ireland. We will come back to that. We're also tomorrow, as promised, we're going to have the big devolution debate. Uh, we're going to take a lot of the programme and talk about the, this question, essentially, does devolution work? So we'll get a little bit on that today and then a lot more tomorrow from right across the United Kingdom. And I want your thoughts on that as well. We're talking later today about a per potential 40% rise in water charges at Thames Water. And actually, speaking of Thames Water, there's another story this morning saying that the boat race rowers, Oxford and Cambridge's uh, rowers, have been told not to enter the Thames due to high levels of E. coli. So both Thames Water and the Thames itself are under fire. Scotland's new hate crime law could be used to settle scores, according to critics. Big article from Andrew Neil in the Daily Mail today. We'll be talking about that. Also, travel issues over Easter. Are you getting away? Perhaps you're in the car at the moment listening to talk radio. Let us know what you're up to this Easter weekend because there's something like 14 million journeys that are taking place this bank holiday weekend. We'll also have the uh, a, a very important investigation by Tech Update into the cheapest Easter eggs. And we'll be finding out why you're not supposed to take a Cadbury's cream egg on a flight. Stay with us here on Talk TV and I want your thoughts as well. 0344. 499-1000 is the number to call. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can WhatsApp as well. You can send me a text message or indeed a voice message. Keep them to about 30, 40 seconds if that's okay. We'll play some of those out if you send them in. We've had two or three previously. 0344-499-1000 is the number for that as well. On Twitter, you can tweet me at Talk TV and you can also follow me at Peter Cardwell. Let's spend the next few hours together here on Talk TV. Well, a major political earthquake in Northern Ireland yesterday. I was reporting on it all day yesterday, all afternoon, I should say, yesterday. There were rumblings on, uh, some say, um, on late Thursday night when the PSNI, the police service in Northern Ireland, said that a 61-year-old man and a 57-year-old woman had been arrested on suspicion of various sexual offences. Then, on the mo apparently later that day, or later on the Thursday, there, uh, Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the DUP, who's an MP, in fact, Northern Ireland's longest serving MP was charged with rape and other allegations, as was the 57-year-old woman. Then on yesterday morning, there, uh, he resigned as leader of the DUP. He was suspended from the Democratic Unionists, the biggest pro-unionist party in Northern Ireland. And it's a very, very interesting and really shocking turn of events. Now, the charges, there are 10 charges that Geoffrey Donaldson and the 57-year-old woman have been charged with. Uh, she has been alleged to have aided and abetted uh, various sexual offences and Geoffrey Donaldson is someone who has uh, been charged with rape and other sexual offences. We don't want to get into that too much although I do want to ask whether he can get a fair trial uh, especially because there's so much speculation online about all sorts of things and we don't want to get into that speculation because we don't want to prejudice a trial of course but also the political ramifications are incredibly important for all of this. Northern Ireland's democracy is incredibly fragile and now Geoffrey Donaldson having stood down there is the uh, the interim leader of the Democratic Unionists is Gavin Robinson, also an MP. And this is what he had to say to Sky's senior Ireland correspondent David Blevins yesterday. 
I think it's been a devastating revelation and has caused tremendous shock, not just for myself personally or my colleagues within the DUP, but for the community right across Northern Ireland. It came as a great shock. Um, but we are a party and individuals that believe in justice. We have faith in our criminal justice system. Uh, and so in the coming days and months, I think it is important that none of us say anything or act in any way uh, that would seek to prejudice <clears throat> what is now an ongoing criminal investigation. And very late last night, uh, the party became aware um, whenever it was revealed uh, publicly that there had been an individual uh, and another charged um, and it became clear to us who that individual was. Um, in the early hours of this morning, we took steps to make sure we could bring colleagues together, uh, discuss what it was uh, we had learned uh, and take the appropriate steps uh, that we could. And as you know, um, Jeffrey Donaldson has stepped down as party leader. Um, he has indicated that to us, but through our disciplinary process, we similarly had to take uh, the steps to suspend him from party membership until the conclusion uh, of what is now alive criminal investigation. Well, that is Gavin Robinson. He is the deputy leader of the DUP, but he's now the interim leader of the party. He's an MP as well, in fact, for East Belfast. But Geoffrey Donaldson is a fascinating character politically. He's been around politics for a very long time. In fact, he was the agent of uh, Enoch Powell in the 1980s as a very young man. He was his campaign manager. And Enoch Powell, as some uh, viewers and listeners may remember, was a unionist politician in Northern Ireland in the very latter stages of his career and won twice, actually. And then Geoffrey Donaldson continued to be involved in politics. He was involved in negotiating the Belfast Agreement. And uh, at the very last minute, actually, on Good Friday in 1998, he walked out of those negotiations and thus a uh, sort of five-year, very fractious period began between him and David Trimble, the leader of uh, the Ulster Unionist Party, which Geoffrey Donaldson was originally a member of uh, over the Belfast Agreement, and uh, Geoffrey Donaldson was a big critic of that. Then, eventually, uh, Geoffrey Donaldson left the Ulster Unionist Party. He then joined the Democratic Unionist Party, their big, big rivals, Ian Paisley's party, and uh, was still an MP for Lagan Valley, which is a constituency outside Belfast. Uh, Lisburn is the main uh, city within that constituency. And uh, then uh, became leader of the DUP after a pretty fractious uh, leadership election a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it was spent nearly three years being um, leader of the DUP. But then this dramatic revelation, huge speculation online, which we're not going to get into today because we're going to be responsible. We're going to stick to the facts on all of this and we're going to look at the political fallout as well as the charges themselves. So Geoffrey Donaldson has now been charged, as has the 57-year-old woman and uh, he will appear in court in Northern Ireland on the 24th of April, so uh, in about uh, three weeks' time in Northern Ireland. We're hoping to speak to Ben Lowry, who is the editor of the newsletter, uh, which is the unionist um, main unionist party, uh, sorry, main unionist paper, I should say, newspaper in Northern Ireland. We're just having a couple of technical issues there, and we will uh, come back to him as soon as we can do that. But let me just read out a couple of um, messages from uh, Chris and Newbury has got in touch about the uh, security, about defence and so on. Uh, Chris and Newbury says, Peter, why didn't the pollsters follow up with their who do you trust more in security, security and defence, Labour or the Tories, by then asking for the three Labour defence policies? They don't because polls are meaningless puff asked by organisations who lost all credibility when they said Corbyn would become PM. Pollsters are in the news because they make up polls to get pollsters on the news. Chris, I, I, I'm afraid I disagree with you. Um, there is a clear methodology in polling. Um, certainly polls get it wrong, but they get it wrong because polls are only a snapshot of what happens on a particular day and how people feel about Jeremy Corbyn, for example, six weeks before an election could be totally different in terms of how people actually vote. Also, people lie to pollsters. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, Joe Twyman is someone who I trust a lot. He is the head of Delta Pool. Um, but there is there is often that question, and Chris, it's a fair question to ask about polling, in terms of saying, how did the pollsters get it wrong? But people do change their minds and people do lie to pollsters. I mean, if you say to people, for example, not on a political matter, but I've heard many times, 
when you say on things like, uh, you know, do you want more the news, for example? You know, do you want more hard-hitting investigations in the news, or do you want more celebrity tittle-tattle? And people always say, oh yes, more more hard-hitting investigations, proper journalism. And then of course the uh, papers and the uh, websites and so on that do the celebrity tittle-tattle always, always get all the all the hits and the clicks and so on. Uh, on um, cream eggs. Uh, Dinah and uh, Dinah and Nick have been in touch and say uh, we guess that cream eggs are suspect on flights because of the liquidish middles. Says Dinah and Nick. Sadly, sadly, our mammy cat uh, passed away just before Christmas. I'm sorry to hear that, um, Dinah and Nick. I know you are people who have been uh, big fans of the program and have uh, often been in touch. So thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, we'll come to Ben Laurie when we can, but Jonathan in Bournemouth has been in touch on the defence budget. This is a big issue, Jonathan. Thanks for your call. Jonathan's given me a ring on 0344 499 1000. And we have uh, the front page of the, I think it's the Daily Mail today. Yeah, I just have it here actually talking about this. Labour more trusted on defence than the Tories. What do you think, Jonathan? Well, the thing is, <clears throat> hello, Peter. Hello you know, there. The thing is, I mean, they are going to say that, aren't they? Because, um, you know, the Tories, uh, the Conservatives have messed it up, you know. So now Labour know that people are upset about this. So, of course, they're going to do better, aren't they? You know, two cheeks on the same backside. As, uh, is it George Galloway that said that? Labour and Conservative. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. Yeah, he, he said that, he's used that phrase a, a, an awful lot of times, actually, Jonathan. In fact, when the, yeah. uh, when the Liberal Democrats were in... Uh, coalition with the Conservatives. He said that Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats were three cheeks of the same backside. But uh, let's not dwell on that too much necessarily. But it's, it's, no. interesting. it's interesting. I, I mean, I, who knows? Um, we, I've, we've actually, I've never pictured that image before. No, no, well, yeah, yeah, you have now, uh, Jonathan, and, and it's, it's one that's going to fester. Um, it's interesting, though, on a more serious note, you've had Grant Shapps uh, openly lobbying for more defence spending. You've had uh, yeah. even James Heapy, who's standing down as Armed Forces Minister after a long time actually he's been in that job for quite a while there are many people who, who really feel defense spending should go up what do you think yourself um, well of course it it should and um, i spent a lot of time in france peter and there's so many parallels at the moment between britain and france you know they've got the same issue there their army isn't fit for purpose now it's under resourced underfunded just like here and of course um, emperor king macron as a lot of French people call him, you know, he's an absolute sociopath, uh, Macron. <laughs> I'm, uh, he really I'm sure he is. would deny that. What, what did you make of the picture he's of him, so, uh, the tough so guy, good. Macron? Oh, he's, he's, I, I can't even laugh, um, Peter, because he's, because he's destroying that country. Um, he's such a horrible, d- dangerous person. But what well, he's, see, he wants to send French troops to Ukraine. Yeah, that, that, that's so mad. That, that's yeah, that's totally course. mad. It's, it's absolutely off the scale bonkers. Yeah, and the French public don't want this. They don't want their, their 19, 20 year old sons. No, you know, especially as we Ukraine. haven't been, a new, new NATO country has been attacked. Like we're, we're giving a huge amount of military aid, uh, France is too to uh, yeah. Ukraine. Uh, we're doing, I think, far, probably far more than we should be doing, although other people will disagree and say, I don't care about innocent civilians who are dead and, and dying in Ukraine. I do. I don't want that to happen. Russia is a terrible aggressor. Putin is an awful person. There's no doubt about that. Um, he is a murderous, tar- tyrannical dictator. Um, and, and we want Ukraine to be safe. But voluntarily putting French troops in uh, then yeah. opens up so many different avenues. Yes, and back to the point, uh, Peter, you know, a lot of experts in France and, you know, army generals are saying, well, it not only is it extremely dangerous, but it's a joke because the French army isn't isn't going to be a, able to do it anyway. You know, yeah. they haven't yeah. got they haven't got the resources, they haven't got the funding, they haven't got the artillery. You know, and it's just like here, Peter. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, it's a very interesting um, point. Then, yeah. Jonathan, you made some really good points. Thank you very much indeed. That's Jonathan in Bournemouth, who's given me a ring there. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. Um, you can call it too to talk about any of the issues this morning. Um, there's been some breaking news uh, in the next in the last few minutes. Several people are being held hostage in a cafe in the Netherlands, according to local media reports. That's a hun- around 150 nearby homes are evacuated in the town of, uh, I think it's Ede, E-D-E, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Ede, yeah, while uh, authorities deal with a hostage situation involving several people, police have said on X, formerly Twitter. The incident is taking place in a cafe 
according to the Dutch news agency AMP, citing a local official. So that's the breaking news, which we'll continue to follow throughout this program, that several people are being held hostage in a cafe in the Netherlands. According to local media reports, around 150 nearby homes have been evacuated in the town of Eid, while authorities deal with a hostage situation involving several people. We'll keep you updated on that. Hopefully, uh, people will be OK. Uh, Angus up north has been in touch on the Jeffrey Donaldson headlines. He says Angela Rayner will have a respite from having to practice what she preaches, which is full tax disclosure. While Labour are playing it safe, keeping their manifesto pledges close to their chest, the MPs need to start behaving like a government in waiting if they can. Uh, Chris Newbury has been back in touch and says, Peter, if you believe pollsters are mostly correct, would you have your salary each week based on three polls by, run by leading pollsters? Come on, they will be mostly right, won't they, <laughs> says Chris Newbury. Um, I mean, if the question is, is Peter not paid enough, and 100% of, of people say yes, then the polls will be right, Chris, and we can trust all pollsters if that is, uh, th those are their findings. Um, listen, thank you for that. Um, we're going to talk to Luke Giddos and Annie MacDonald next here on Talk TV. Uh, we have our panel with all the issues that are happening. We will cover Northern Ireland at some stage throughout the programme. We haven't been able to get in touch with our guest. Apologies for that, but we will try to get him or someone else before the end of the programme. So stay with us here on Talk TV. Lots to discuss. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Thank you to Christine and Surrey who's been in touch. She says, we, Peter, we must increase our military spending. Terrorism is on the rise, and that includes Russia. The constant flow of migrants is no accident. I'm genuinely concerned, especially as we have such weak leadership on both sides of the House, says Christine. Thank you for that. Tony says, Russia 
has annihilated Ukraine's air defences. Zelensky is talking about retreating to save troops and equipment. The game is up. That's Tony in Liverpool. David Epping says, Peter, for their shareholders, the water companies have long been an overweight cash cow and money that should have been used to upgrade critical infrastructure has merely ended up lining pockets. I, I think that's a very good point, like Dave, when you talk about those shareholder dividends and so on. When that happens, Dave continues, it tells me that privatisation provides a legal green light for embezzlement. And who ends up being done over? Well, there's no suggestion that anybody at, at Thames Water has embezzled anything. Uh, but it's nonetheless a point that Dave makes. Yes, you've guessed that the good old taxpayer pays the price. We may have cleaned up tap water, but beyond that, we're effectively funding the fouling up of our rivers and coastlines, says Dave. I mean, this is a massive issue. And we're talking properly a little bit later on about the 40, potential 40% rise from Thames Water. And Thames Water is the biggest water company in the United Kingdom, but there are lots of other water companies, not just in the southeast. Of course, we always, always remember 82% of our viewers and listeners at Talk TV live outside London. We are not a London-centric station, but this story is relevant to everybody because so many of these water companies are acting in ludicrous ways, charging people an absolute fortune for water when uh, there's so much sewage, there's so much pollution and so on. We'll talk about that in just a second uh, with our panel of Luke Gittos and Andy McDonald. But I just uh, another Andy actually from the Midlands has been in touch and says, we are in NATO, equal cost with all of Europe. You kind of cannot afford it. We need to invest and build our own forces. One more before we go to the panel from Anil in uh, Cheam in Surrey. Morning, Peter. The problem with Labour is that they think they have already won the election and uh, they are running the country. They will have the shock of their lives when the general election results are announced. In the same uh, same when we woke up realising that we were no longer part of Europe after Brexit. They have no policies other than the U-turn policy. My goodness. Well, let's put this to Andy MacDonald, uh, who's trade unionist. Hi, Andy. Good to have you back in the studio. Thank you. And Luke Gittos, who is a lawyer at Murray Human Solicitors and a writer for Spiked Online. Uh, really good to see you back in the studio, both of you. You've been on together before, haven't you? I think. Never. 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 No, have never you not? Yeah. I thought I thought you had a hard. We even completely ignored each other before the... Yeah, Excellent. We, we did recognise each other. Was, that's uh, good. That's yeah. good. We, we like that. A good bit of hostility on <laughs> on, a, on a Saturday morning, um, no, I think I think Easter. The message of Easter is reconciliation. So yes. let, let's see, let's see how fractious it gets over the next half an hour. But listen, thank you both very much for coming in. Um, do you agree with that texter, Andy, who says Labour have no policies and uh, we might get a shock when time goes on? We've had uh, Professor Sir John Curtis, who is the sort of doyen of political prediction. He's a he's a, a sophologist who says that there is a ninety nine percent chance of a Labour government after the next election. Yeah, yeah, he made it fairly clear that in his opinion it's a well res respected opinion that Labour are going to have a, a pretty easy run at the next election but I think it's untrue to say that they don't have any policies obviously they don't have specific policies lined out because you know the election hasn't been called the manifesto. the Tories to steal them all. Well exactly you know like uh, the non-dom like non tax yeah. basis that was something that they really built on really established and then the Tories nicked it in the budget. Uh, when the election is called I'm sure the full manifesto will be written out and all the policies they, that they always say be through, out. They always sort of say through gritted teeth we're absolutely delighted the government has <laughs> yeah. adopted this policy. Um, Luke it's interesting that the front page of the Daily Mail, an exclusive poll for them, saying that Labour is more trusted on defence than the Tories. Uh, people now associate Conservatives with cutting military spending. We've had quite a lot of reaction to that already on the programme. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, I was trying to find out the difference between Labour and Tory on defence, and I found a speech given by John Healy earlier this year. Shadow Defence Secretary. Shadow Defence Secretary, exactly, talking about the introduction of a new military strategic headquarters, uh, the creation of a new role to do with military uh, procurement, but no further commitments on spending whatsoever. And presumably that's because they need the intelligence in order to be able to... Budget. They need to look at the books, really, yeah, and exactly. that's that's always very difficult because the civil service, as we as we all know, will look at that behind the scenes and see how those spending plans will actually work out. But it is it is fascinating that the question is between the Conservatives and Labour Party, which party do you trust more in national security and defence? Conservatives twenty three, Labour thirty four, both equally fourteen percent. Neither party twenty one eight percent don't know. And actually, on the government in particular, is it spending too much, too little, or about the right amount on defence? Too little, 40. Too much, 9. Right amount, 34. What do you make of those findings, Andy? Well, I, I think it, it's really, really interesting for the Labour Party because generally, you know, defence and the economy, it's always been the Conservatives. Law and kind order. Of, it's been their kind of home... It's been their home. But on you know, those it's been, three it's issues, been... defence, law and order, economy, yeah. Labour are now leading. I mean, I think it, it really does show that the tide has turned fully on the Conservatives, you know, Labour are, uh, somehow they've just kind of let their enemies hang themselves, they've kind of stepped back and just let the Conservatives implode, as the Labour Party did, you know, between 2016 and 19, and it's just, just 
baffling, really. But I think it's just on defence spending. I was reading Dominic Cummings' blog uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that all the defence spending figures are completely skewed because of class- classified spending. They can't include it in the public right. reports. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it's always one of those that I'm sure there's other things going on in the behind the scenes. But, God, yeah, the polls are absolutely incredible. I, I couldn't believe it when I read it this morning. Although maybe it's just inevitable that on all these issues, you know, if Labour are so far ahead in the polls, they're bound to be ahead on individual issues. Johnny's been in touch on WhatsApp, actually. 03444991000 is the WhatsApp number. He says, Hi, Peter. NATO is not equipped to fight Russia, as it's not as united as would seem. And if America pulled from NATO, which is more than possible, put, although, well, I mean, Donald Trump says he's committed to, to NATO, um, and Biden is certainly committed. Anyway, uh, Johnny continues, if uh, America pulled from NATO, which is more than possible, Putin will look to reap the revenge on Europe as a whole and the show of absolute force showing America how exactly how powerful Macron needs to keep his mouth shut and realise NATO is a united force. He also says, great show, Peter. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, Let's uh, talk about another story here. I want to get your opinion on this, uh, Luke. This is another idea. This is from the Daily Telegraph that Tory MPs are planning for migrant crime league tables. Migrant nationalities with the highest rate of crime will be revealed in league tables under plans to be considered by ministers. Is this a good idea? No, it's a racist one. I do think that when you uh, propose something which would involve an individual's visa or asylum claim being judged more harshly because of where they're from, that is a racist policy. There's no two ways about it. I do think it's also completely wrong-headed in terms of what they're trying to achieve in policy terms. So this is clearly targeted at concerns around specific immigrant groups partic- committing particular kinds of crime. I mean, that really should be a job for the National Crime Agency to be concerned with, not with the, uh, not necessarily with the Home Office around immigration. Those two things should be distinguished. But look, if you look around the most recent headline-grabbing cases, you know, um, Mr Azadi, the uh, alkaline attacker, I mean, he was turned down twice for asylum mm. uh, before a judge then granted his application. The problem there wasn't with scrutiny over his application. The application was refused twice. Similarly, with the we saw with the Liverpool bomber, the bomber who uh, many people forget about, who den- detonated a bomb outside a maternity ward in Liverpool, he had his application for asylum mm. refused twice, but the Home Office couldn't kick him out. So the problem here, the problems with our asylum system are very deep rooted. Um, and but this policy, the idea that we would effectively treat certain visa or asylum claims more harshly because of where a particular applicant is from, mm. that would be completely wrong-headed morally and in terms of policy. And I think we have to call it what it is. It uh, would be so, racist. Some U.S. states and Denmark do this. The crime rates of those from Kuwait, Tunisia, Lebanon, Somalia are far higher than those of Danish nationals, uh, and the Danish people know about that because this uh, happens. What do you make of this policy, Andy? I mean, I, I'm all for data collection and data analysis, but I think, uh, as you said, if it were to affect people's lives, you know, that weren't involved in the crimes of those people, that would be racist and it would be profiling. You know, in Denmark, I don't think it affects the visas process, does it? I think they just have the statistics by nationality. So I, I think having the statistics by nationality, it's a bit kind of iffy. I'm sure it'll just fuel the far right's hate, honestly. And what they're, t- but what they're talking about is treating certain applications more harshly and with greater scrutiny based on where people are from. But surely the, the, the data, I, I agree with you that I think this is racist, but I'm just playing devil's advocate for a second. If you are from a certain country, surely there are all sorts of factors in relation to, for example, Somalia, which would be very different from uh, factors in regard to Eritrea, for we example. Can, can, I mean, that yeah. th- those, those will influence the asylum process. We can perfectly reasonably recognise that there are certain immigrant communities who are overrepresented when it comes to crime and particularly organised crime you know that is a real problem yeah um, but that doesn't and should not translate into how we deal with asylum and visa applications yeah. from everyday citizens and, from those and, countries. and I speak as someone from a background where in the 1970s people made all sorts of the 80s people made all sorts yeah. of assumptions of people from my background who may well have had absolutely nothing to do with uh, the uh, terrorism that was going on we have more breaking news um, this is an Israeli strike has hit a car carrying a United Nations observers outside a town in southern Lebanon. It's wounded several observers according to two security sources who have told the Reuters news agency the Israeli military said uh, contrary to the reports it did not strike a UNIFIL vehicle in the area of the border town of Ramesh I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, there is was no immediate comment from uh, the UN peacekeeper mission in uh, southern Lebanon, Lebanon that's UNIFIL about the incident so uh, a disputed report there about an Israeli strike hitting a car carrying United Nations observers outside a town in southern Lebanon, uh, wounding several observers. That's according to security sources telling Reuters news 
agency, the Israeli military said, contrary to the reports, it did not strike a vehicle in the area of the border town of Ramesh. We'll bring you the latest on that and indeed the Netherlands story uh, as well. So stay with us for that throughout the programme. Um, Lots and lots of people getting in touch on all sorts of issues. Barry says, "I would trust Labour to push a wheelbarrow. I would trust would trust Labour to push a wheelbarrow, let alone run the country." I think he means wouldn't trust Labour to push a wheelbarrow. They always uh, shout about the Tories being mired in sleaze, but try to reflect attention away from Rayner's latest adventures. This is Angela Rayner. She uh, ha- apparently has received advice on her home and second home and capital gains tax, uh, and we're, we're told that totally vindicates her, but the question is, well, if it totally vindicates her, why don't you publish it? Um, it would be the, the next logical part of that. Um, uh, someone else, Barry has also said that Angela Rayner was present at the Beer and Curry Party in Durham, which Starmer tried to conveniently forget. It will be a nightmare when they get in. Well, listen, the, the, the police decided twice not to prosecute in that uh, situation, but um, Beer Starmer is certainly something which continues to follow Keir Starmer around. Labour won't win the election, the Tories will lose it, says Barry. Peter says Thames Water should be allowed to go bust. Shareholders must take the hit. They have indebted the company while benefiting from outrageous and unwarranted dividend payments. It is time to take any water companies in financial trouble back into public ownership. I wonder what trade unionist Andy McDonald thinks of that. I can't predict what you might possibly say when I ask you if water companies should be brought back into public ownership. I, I think I think genuinely nationalisation is the path forward with kind of uh, with public energy. With pub- we need public energy. We need, we need public water. That's what we need. Railways. Railways, no, I think we should have regionalised railways, honestly, because if you look at TfL, you look at uh, the Greater Manchester bus network, I think when we look at it on a kind of internal transport scale, it's gone quite well when it's been regionalised. TfL's gone quite well, really? Well, it's, it's the best metro system in the UK. Yeah. Transport for London? Well, yeah, I mean, it, that, is, it is objectively the that, best transport system in the UK. That, that may well be the case, but... Uh, TfL's po- fantastic. Po- possibly a low you know, base. I mean, you know, a lot, uh, a, Crossrail wasn't exactly a, 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 a huge success, was you know, it? Well, we're both from outside of London. Yes. You know, I don't know if you are as well. No, I'm from London. But, yeah. but TfL is objectively the best transport system in the UK. In, in, if the, we had in it, the UK? If we had it, transport if we, if we well, had thank it, you. Transport if we had it across the country, it would be incredible. Yes, yes, that's fine. I don't disagree with it anything. Incredible. But the fact is that the best transport system in the UK is a bit like saying sort of, you know, I don't know, the the um, you know the, the the slimmest member of James Corden's family. I mean, it's just it's sort of you know it's not exactly a ringing endorsement yeah. like get us. Well, no, I agree. I mean, I was on the tube yesterday, and it took two hours to get from central London to East London. It's beset with problems. Uh, that's, that's not to say that it's not good a good example in in the context of the United Kingdom, but that just speaks to our complete lack of transport infrastructure when it comes to the rest of the country. I mean, I you know I spent some time in Newcastle. They have a wonderful metro system up there that does seem to function um, f- fairly effectively, uh, and, and other parts of the country may be similar. But I, I do think uh, when it comes to uh, nationalisation, you know, the crisis around water is, is a serious one, and, and we should have yeah. a serious debate around um, what kind of utility should be in public ownership. Uh, that's an, uh, it's a publicly popular policy. Yeah. Uh, it's one thing that Jeremy Corbyn seemed to get right when it came to communicating with the British public. So there is a room for debate on this, certainly around water, uh, and argue about around transport as well yeah absolutely um, I should say I should apologize to uh, uh, Luke uh, to um, James Corden's family there I'm often it's often it has often been said not not least by a few texters in this program that I look like a slightly thinner James Corden uh, so there we are uh, but I'm sure there are many members of the family who are very healthy and I shouldn't be fat shaming them uh, but in terms of uh, water it's a very very interesting one there's actually another report out today uh, saying that um, that that the uh, rowers in the boat race between Oxford and Cambridge shouldn't actually uh, ingest or even go into the Thames itself because of E. coli. Yeah. So, uh, e- I mean, look, the, the Thames is never going to be the the the, uh, the the river that is the the purest water necessarily. But when it comes to not just the water in the Thames, but also Thames water, these things are very controversial. Luke. Well, I hear that they there is a tradition after the boat race that they throw the cocks yeah. into the water. It would somewhat detract from the spectacle. That, that's the person where... who shouts at them and tells yeah. them to go. Shouts quickly. at the front, yes, yeah, yeah. as far as I understand. I mean, yeah, right. usually a little person. Yeah, <laughs> OK. So but it would rather detract from the spectacle if uh, he had to sort of wear a hazmat suit to be thrown in there yes, to present himself getting covered in E. coli. I mean, look, I think the pro- problem with... The, Problems with the river pollution are awful. I mean, apparently the Thames is a comparatively clean river when it comes to you. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. But, but there is a massive issue in terms of cleaning up a river. Is Loch Ness in Northern Ireland, for example, absolutely destroyed in uh, recent years because of pollution and so on? There are so many water supplies, sewage. Uh, I mean, it's just it's so basic, isn't it? You just sort of say to Thames Water and other companies like that that actually, you know, you had two jobs: one, give us clean water; two, get rid of the water that isn't clean. Just do that. 
Well, you, aren't they? You, you'd think it would be be simple enough, but I guess if I could do it, I'd be running Thames Water. I wouldn't be on Talk TV. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just think this this boat race story is just so bizarre, isn't it, really? Uh, as long as just tell them to keep their mouth shut, you know, just don't swallow the water and they'll be fine. Yes. Question mark? Yes. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm sure when Cambridge win, as they have done until the last four years then uh, you know they'll still throw them in can i can i be incredibly sexist on on this point um so they've now started to say usually bbc say well the men's boat race was what run by this these people this this university oxford and cambridge and the um the women's boat race was won by this there is one boat race it is between the men. Sorry, that is that is oh, women's boat race is fantastic. I, I mean, it is. It's great, it's good for them. But the fantastic. boat race is between. But I, what I what I always think is we need to we need to congratulate both Oxford and Cambridge because they always get to the final. Yeah, yes. you know they always they, they <laughs> get through those heats <laughs> and they get to the final. Listen, enough about that. Uh, James and Nebworth says, "Morning. The government can spend as much as they want on defence, but until they bring back crown immunity and start building this country back into something we can be proud of." Who's going to sign up and fight? I served tw- over 20 years ago. I was very proud to, uh, but the country was different then. I wouldn't sign up now. Actually, that's an interesting point, James. I just want to read you out something again from the Daily Mail about conscription. This is something we talk about every now and again on this programme. And a number of people say, oh, there should be conscription and young people who don't uh, you know, contribute to our society or are not in education, uh, employment or training, well, they should be conscripted and they should go into the military. But when you talk to almost anyone in the military, they say, no, we want the people who want to be there. We want the people who want to uh, train and fight and be the brave men and women who are in our armed services. We don't want to cajole and dragoon people into it. So one of the questions on from the Daily Mail in regard to this defence, uh, defending Britain must be our priority, is the headline. To what extent, if at all, would you support or oppose the reintroduction of national service? 16% of people strongly support it. 24% of people support it. Neither support or oppose 25. Oppose 15%. Strongly oppose 13. Don't know 7. Andy, what's your reaction to those figures? I think it probably does reflect the national mood. You know, often I do say ignore the polls, but, you know, if I was conscripted, I'd go up. But, like, you wouldn't see me, you know, supporting it as a policy. Like, uh, I think national service is bizarre. Like you said, actual people in the service don't really agree with it. So yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. What do you think, uh, Luke? Well, I think you're caller or texter made a really interesting point about the willingness to sign up and why someone would sign up to fight for this army I mean I'm as a lawyer I remember I followed the Philip Shiner case which yes. was involving a, a human rights lawyer that basically brought industrial scale litigation against yeah. members of the British army absolutely so a cause that was raised by, yeah a cause that was taken up by Johnny Mercer and not talked about enough actually mm. that you know soldiers who are fighting on the front line uh, ended up subject to a number of very spurious I mean entirely yeah. spurious often falsified human rights claims uh, that, and, and it just goes into this tide of feeling or ill feeling about British soldiers and br- pretty much anyone who is uh, out there sort of making a stake for the British country I mean I think that is a, a problem that we've got now. And, and I agree with that point but at the same time they do have to be held accountable and they do have to have a higher level uh, they don't want moral equivalence but, with the people they are fighting against. But I just, I, on what planet do we think that the British Army acts with, without any scrutiny whatsoever I mean that's just not the reality point, we don't, we don't, ne- we don't need um, uh, you know human rights lawyers I'm afraid to, 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 to further that scrutiny uh, in, in the way that at least I mean Philip human rights lawyers who are doing their job yeah, of course. Uh, correctly, uh, yeah. would 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 are fine, but people like Phil exactly. Shiner, who I'm afraid just has no reputation. And, yeah, and I use him as an example, not to sully the name of human rights lawyers, but to, to raise a point about the position that British soldiers hold in this country, which yeah. is something we should be talking more about. That there is not that sense that they are doing something important. There is not something that there, there's no idea that they are doing an, a, an act of national service, and there's very little value attached to that. And that's what I think the the whole affair around Philip Shiner really illustrates is that we we did allow them to be put through the ringer in a way which really reflected a level of contempt for, for what they did. And so wh- why would you sign up for the British Army? What, what, what's the point in signing up where your service is not treated with value and respect? I Do think you think we treat uh, servicemen and women with value and respect, Andy? No, I, I don't, to be honest. I mean, you know, the easy comparison is America. You know, they almost worship them as if they were a religion. I, I agree they go too far, but I think we could take a bit from America and have a bit more respect still, just, you know. It, it, it's it's very bizarre because in America they found that it was easier to worship them than support them. Here we've we're not really worshiping them and we're not really supporting yeah. them, and it, it, it's a very bizarre combination. Well, it, it it's so um, frequent that you, in America I, I spent a, a decent amount of time, about ten days in America, on a, a research trip, um, sort of holiday research trip in uh, in. Uh, May, June, on a number of places I went in the sort of deep south, Alabama, uh, Texas and so on, you had people in uniform 
coming into places, getting all sorts of discounts, uh, military discounts, 25% military discount, things like that. In this country, we just don't do that, really, to the, certainly not to the same extent anyway. And I remember, and apologies if this is a, is a sort of virtue signal, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of the UK Army, and you know they kept me safe as a kid, basically, and they, uh, they helped the Northern Ireland peace process happen. It wouldn't have happened without them. Not everybody will agree with that, but that is my opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I always try, if I'm in, if I see someone in, you know, I'll be sometimes at McDonald's, for example, I'll try and buy someone's meal for them, and I'd have done that a couple of times. And, I mean, there's sort of astonishment that that could happen. I do think we do, we, we just need to have our servicemen and women treated with a lot more, a lot more respect. Barbara's been in touch. She says, uh, Peter, your guest promoting B buses in Greater Manchester. Has he actually used one? It's a shocking service. Either they're 45 minutes late or don't turn up at all. That's not true. I have used the B network uh, in the year that it's been established and it's fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I can pull up the app right now and show, uh, you know, the buses are regularly timed and on time. Are you from Manchester? Uh, no, I'm from the Midlands, but uh, okay. I've worked in Manchester. Lived in yeah, Manchester, yeah, sure, so, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Manchester. I think it's a great city. I've been there quite a lot, usually for deeply boring political conferences, <laughs> it must be said. Uh, we're going to talk more with Luke and Andy uh, next here on Talk TV. Stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Whirl -missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Thank you to James and Nebworth who says, Morning, the government can spend as much as like on. Uh, oh, sorry, I read out that one. Um, uh, Jill in County Ross Common says, Good morning, Peter. My husband and I watch Talk TV every day from County Ross Common, but we are really disappointed that even Talk TV has come to the dumbing down. Sunday is Easter Sunday, not Easter Day. Be proud of our traditions. Happy Easter, says Jill in County Ross Common. It's interesting, I heard someone yesterday on air call it Easter Day, and uh, I wonder, is that is that a thing? Is that what people say? I refer to it as Easter Day. 
earlier. So um, yeah, maybe maybe that's wrong. Let's just call it Easter Sunday. Um, many people saying Happy Easter, including someone called Julia says Happy Easter, Peter, and everyone at Talk TV. Thank you, Julia. Happy Easter. Although tomorrow's the main day, but thank you very much indeed. Uh, Shane and Sydney has been in touch. It is Easter with him because he is ahead or almost almost Easter in a couple of hours anyway. Shane says, G'day, Peter. Happy Easter to you. Jack, always enjoy watching you on Saturday night, uh, which is nice. Um, so, uh, and Lauren has been in touch from Bath, who says, um, I don't think you look like James Corden. Uh, this is a lazy comparison. The haircut, uh, colour and eye colour are vaguely similar, but that is it. And also Chris, producer in the break, has said, um, my mention of having a McDonald's, he said, I thought you were exclusive to Pizza Express. Um, so there we are. Anyway, on much more important issues, uh, Luke Gittos and Andy McDonald are still with us. And uh, I mean, there is this absolutely shocking story in regard to a photography firm cutting out children with special needs from a school photo. This uh, firm has sincerely apologised, I bet you it has, to parents after they offered primary school class pictures that omitted pupils with special needs. I want to talk about that in a second, but I also want your reaction to all of these stories. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. That's what Martin has called. Uh, about, uh, he's from Isleworth in West London about uh, national service. Martin, you're very welcome to the programme. What do you what do you make of this kind of idea, this debate, and this polling in the Daily Mail as well? Uh, what, what's your what's your opinion? Uh, yes, thank you, Tina. Um, well, the, you made the point quite succinctly that the, um, the the people in the actual forces don't like the idea because they don't want people with them who don't want to be there. Um, but the, uh, it this begs the question that the uh, a, a, a national service program necessarily has to be compulsory. You see, if I mean, if, if you're on the dole and you don't have any money and you're bored um, and that you're wondering where your life's going, and somebody presents you with a, the opportunity to do some sensible training, uh, which is going to improve your job prospects by you know orders of magnitude, then uh, there'd be an awful lot of people who would you know, be very keen to take it well, let, let's, without necessarily having a sanction if they didn't. Let's take this a different way, Martin. I mean, you talked about useful training that would make sure you got a job. Certainly, the military offers that. There's absolutely no doubt that people who come out of the, uh, the services have incredible skills, uh, often engineering, uh, logistics, all yeah. sorts of things that they have. But, you, I mean, should th shouldn't this be broadened out a bit? In Germany, for example, if you have someone like, I would have been useless in the army. I can barely run the length of myself. I'm overweight, you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not athletic. There's no doubt about that. And qu quite frankly, whilst I have the greatest of admiration for anybody in the armed services, I, it, it would not have appealed to me as a way of life. But in Germany, for example, and other countries, they have a form of national service where you can, for example, work in a care home. You can do volunteering in other ways. You can uh, help uh, you know, clean up neighbourhoods and so on. Is that a good idea? That, that sounds like a very good idea. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, well, thank you, Martin. Appreciate that. And uh, let's put that to to Luke and Andy. What do you, what do you make of a different form of national service as they do in Germany and some other countries as well, Luke? Well, I think this discussion around national service and the different forms it can take sort of rears its head every few years. And I think really what this debate is about is British values and really pa and about patriotism and the place of patriotism in our society. And I think one thing we are facing at the moment is a generation of young people who don't like the country very much, who are a bit disillusioned yeah. with Western values, who are, don't really have any truck for ideas like free speech, freedom of expression. Maybe I'm, and this is a crass generalisation, of course, but th th there is uh, some truth I in it, and th there is some truth in the idea that there is a lot of confusion about what it means to be British yep. and why that is something to be proud of. National service, I don't think, can correct that. Mm -hmm. I think it can help to create a sense of community, but I do think community has to be something that's built from the bottom up. Yeah. But we can start building that sense of community by stopping doing down our country quite as much as we do, having some respect for the values that we all hold, the Western civilizational values that we all hold. I think that has to be our starting point. Yep. And starting with national service seems to put the cart mm. before the horse. For I, I, I think I agree with that. Also, maybe you just shouldn't do down the transport networks. Um, Andy, what do, you, what do you make of what Luke said, which I thought was pretty sensible? Well, I, I think, you know, on national service, it should be more like the, the German system if we were to implement it. You know, and we have things like the it. National Citizenship Service, yeah. for example. We yeah. have Duke of Edinburgh, all sorts of ways that, that young people can... Uh, 
uh, contribute in some way, and many of them do, of course. And we can't just generalise and say, well, all Gen Z are lazy and hate Britain, but not that not that Luke was doing that. But I think, but I think some people I might do think be that. Gen Z. When's the Gen Z cut off? I don't know. I'm a millennial, but just about. I'm I'm almost too old to be a millennial. I'm I might be a Gen Z. Well, I, I like free speech. You, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I love free speech. But anyway, anyway I back no to, back to the, I I, I, I wrote down a note about this. Uh, my housemate Ted, Ted, if you're watching, uh, I'm about to shout you out. Um, he's he worked in hospitality for quite a few years. And he said that they should have a national service for hospitality. So now everyone has a bit more respect towards hospitality workers mm. and doesn't, you know, abuse their waitresses and servers and is nasty to them. But I, I think that actually holds some merit. I think if we push people who are on benefits for just un- unemployment, not sickness or yes. um, uh, other benefits, uh, if we push them onto kind of industries that are understaffed to create programmes with employers like in construction. But also, there's a hundred thousand jobs in construction. I, I totally agree with you, but this is the dilemma for many British businesses where they say, uh, do I want someone who's been sitting around for two years doing nothing when they could have worked, or do I want someone who is perhaps an immigrant who's come and said immediately, you know, day one, get me this job in this building site? Well, well, uh, well even you know, if they did prefer the immigrants, you know, a lot of them have left. There are a hundred thousand yeah. vacancies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so at the end of the day, they don't really have a massive option. Yeah. Um, when it when it when it no, comes it's, to it's, it's uh, a fair it, point. On Gen Z, were you born between 1997 and 2012? I was indeed. I'm Gen Z. Are you well, Gen, Z? Gen Z? No, I'm a millennial. When were you born? Yeah. 1986. 1986. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're definitely, millennial? definitely a millennial. So, so, definitely so, millennial. Definitely a millennial. so 96 to what, like 80? I, 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 1997 to 2012. No, apparently. millennial. What's oh, 80, 80, 81 to 96? Apparently. Anyway, who listen, comes up um, with these? Who makes yeah. these? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the law. It's the law. Um, one thing I am very, very much not happy with is the photography firm cutting out children with special needs from a school photo. This is parents who attended a Boyne primary school in Aberdeenshire were horrified after being sent a link from Tempest Photography offering them choice of pictures with or without children with additional support needs. Uh, I mean, this is just appalling, aren't they? Yeah, it, it's it's dreadful. And, you know, just reading the statement they've they've given, it said, we're a family-run business, so they're trying to get a bit of sympathy. And then they say it's not standard procedure. But if you're a family-run business, I'm assuming it's quite a small company. Well, it may not be standard so procedure, but someone's made a decision it's, somewhere. It's just, it's a very bizarre statement, a very bizarre incident. I don't even know what the thought process would be of the photographer to go, we don't want you in the picture. It's we are just, taking this matter very seriously. We're committed to implementing meaningful change to, to prevent an occurrence in the future. Well, maybe you shouldn't have done it in the first yeah, place. Um, I, I have had a, a horrible story, actually, from a school not involving um, special needs children, but a, a school I know a little bit about, where there was a choir, and at one stage, people, the children, they were talking about, like, nine- and ten-year-old children, and there was a choir that was very good, but there were some children who aren't, weren't as good in the choir, and they were taken out of the choir. I mean, like, that's OK when you're a little bit older, when there's a competitive process to get into these sorts of, uh, you know, school activities and, like, competition is a part of life and so on. But special needs children, I mean, that is just horrendous, Luke. Of course, well, look, of course it is. I'm just going to put a little bit of a dampener on this, because I do think the, the company has come out and said we are mortified that this has happened. All the reporting around this I've read has said just how mortified this company are. They're Clearly, someone has made an egregious mistake. I mean, they couldn't ask for a worse public relations <laughs> gaffe, could yes, they? I mean, it is, yes. in, in the contemporary context, they have placed an atomic bomb under their public relations. They stuff. have. So um, I, I do think, you know, that there is capacity here to, to forgive. And, and the, the broad picture is, look, obviously special needs education in this country has come on an enormous way in the last two decades. I mean, I spent my early years... Uh, assisting a young kid with cerebral palsy to be integrated into a mainstream school. And the process was, I mean, maybe I had a halcyon experience with it, but it was, these children are part of part of school culture in a of way course they would, you know, never would have, have have been maybe 40 or 50 it's years It's so ago. much better now. And but, so, but, still, but still we have this. And also there's a story about Sally Phillips, the actress, uh, who said she was so upset after her son who has Down syndrome was not allowed to play in a trampoline part because they said he needed a letter from his GP to take part. Um, I mean, they say now, now saying they're deeply sorry he would not take part and was left disappointed and uh, this was apparently following safety guidance from British gymnastics. But there is still discrimination but, uh, against people who have special needs. But I think that that Sally Phillips example is a classic one of where guidance and the fear of litigation actually these organisations that are worried about what might happen if they let kids just get on with being kids steps in in a really destructive way. I mean, yep. I think what we need to do is just 
allow people to have a bit of human, ha have complete humanity mm. over these kinds of decisions, and obviously let children play on trampoline parks, whatever their, uh, you know, whatever their position. And it, but, but these individual examples are egregious and horrible when they happen. But I think we do need to put it in a context where, um, f thankfully, that th those attitudes are in, in massive decline. Um, we have, uh, yeah, well, we'll certainly continue to talk about this story as well. Thank you to Annie MacDonald, uh, the trade unionist, and to Luke Gittos as well. Uh, Luke is a lawyer at Murray Human Solicitors and writer for Spiked Online. So thank you both thank you. very, very much indeed. Busy morning, lots and lots uh, happening. Uh, Martin says, I'm ex-Royal Navy. Once you get past basic training and branch training, it's the best job in the world. You're paid to travel the world. I join again tomorrow, even though I'm 65. Good stuff. Amanda says, uh, can anyone put their finger on the point when this country lost its patriotism? I can remember back in the 80s, when at the airport in Antigua waiting for a BA flight home, all the Brits would cheer loudly when the plane came into view. I wonder if this still happens. I, I think not. I think the novelty has perhaps worn off, uh, Amanda. Um, Andy's been in touch and says, Ireland, don't get involved with wars. We are tiny and cannot afford it. Our war is with immigration that's changing our way of life. Uh, sorry, that's Andy from the Midlands, but he's commentating on all sorts of issues there. Uh, Dave uh, says, good morning, Peter. I don't trust Labour to fund the military as it needs to. More talk from Captain Hindsight. None of the parties seem interested in this country anymore. Graham says, morning Peter, once uh, people find out Labour are going to massively hike council taxes and install new laws in every city, the voting public will turn against them, Labour will destroy this country. I, I don't think that is actually Labour policy, um, Graham, we'll see anyway. Um, Gen Z in the army would make a brilliant TV show, says Karen, um, so thank you very much indeed for that. And Aubrey from Westminster says, hi Peter, I'm disappointed to hear you referring to the Labour lockdown beer and curry night as Beer Starmer. Uh, uh, surely the incident should be referred to by the far more obvious Farty Gate. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that, Aubrey, in Upminster. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll return to serious issues uh, next here on Talk TV uh, when we'll be talking about Thames Water shareholders demanding a 40% bill rise after cutting off funding. Absolutely disgraceful. Stay with us. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. It was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Well, a very good morning. Thank you so much for your company. I'm Peter Cardwell here until one o'clock on Talk TV. I'm back tomorrow as well between 10 and 1 and then again on Monday between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. I'm filling in for Ian Collins. So uh, it would be great to have your company for that as well this Easter bank holiday weekend. And if you are celebrating Easter, a very happy Easter to you. Although tomorrow, of course, is Easter Sunday. It's the main day. Lots to discuss today. We're talking about uh, what Andrew Neil says in the Daily Mail today. They've crashed the schools, the health service and the economy. Now the SNP are set to destroy free speech with a hate crime law that's an Orwellian nightmare. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on. We'll be talking about Thames Water, shareholders demanding a 40% bill rise after cutting off funding. The water companies right across the UK are absolutely in crisis and there's a huge scandal. I mean, 40% rises. Now, this is over a few years, but nonetheless, we're in a cost of living crisis. This is outrageous and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Also talk about the travel issues over the Easter weekend. There are something like 14 million journeys that are happening uh, at the moment. Uh, so let us know your thoughts on all of this. We're talking about conscription as well, all sorts of topics and whatever you want to talk about as well because this is my show but it's your show too. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can text me on 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can tweet me at talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell. You can also WhatsApp me and send me a voice message on WhatsApp as well as a text message on WhatsApp. New service 0344 499-1000. If you are sending a voice message, a little recording, just try and keep it to under a minute. Tech Up Dave has been furiously editing some of them over the past little while. We'll be talking to him later as well about the cheapest Easter eggs this Easter weekend. He's done extensive research into that and I'm going to be doing extensive research in eating them. So stay with us. Lots to come up between now and one o'clock on Talk TV. Well, before we go on, just as promised, I uh, met a very, very nice woman and a uh, fan of the show called Katie. I met her in Maidstone, uh, sorry, Maidenhead. Uh, I met her in Maidenhead last weekend. I was at an event. Her name was Katie, and I promised her I would say hello. So, hello, Katie. Thank you so much for your loyalty and for watching and listening to the show. I also want to say a very happy birthday to Carolyn, who is the owner of Pluckley, who's a former cat of the week. Carolyn is, her birthday is on Wednesday, and I want to wish her many, many happy returns uh, celebrating her birthday, and I'm sure. Pluckley will uh, be very happy to give her a cuddle uh, to say happy birthday to her. We have some breaking news, two bits of breaking news actually this morning. Um, one is about an Israeli strike that uh, hit a car ca carrying a United Nations observer outside a town in southern Lebanon. Apparently it wounded several observers, although the Israeli military says it is contrary to the reports it did not strike a vehicle from UNIFIL, which is the uh, the UN agency in that area. Uh, UNFIL said, UNIFIL says four workers have been injured. We'll bring you the latest on that as we get it between now and one o'clock. There's also, uh, I was talking to you a little bit earlier about what happened in the Netherlands about hostages and the police say that three hostages who were being held at Cafe Petticoat, which is a popular bar and nightclub in the city of Eid, have been released but added that the situation remains ongoing. So there is a development in that case in the Netherlands. We will of course bring you the very latest on that as time goes on. 
Um, I want to talk now about Thames Water because they've been privatised, as have most water companies in the United Kingdom. Their shareholders are now demanding that bills, this is Thames Water, the biggest uh, water company in the UK, but many other water companies are presumably thinking about the same thing because they've been uh, so dreadful in the last while in regard to so much sewage, high prices, dividends to shareholders, which, look, they're a commercial company, dividends to shareholders are, are what they do. But now shareholders are demanding a 40% rise in water bills after cutting off funding. This is the owners of Thames Water refusing to provide a £500 million cash injection to prevent its collapse as they renew demands for household bills to increase by 40%. This is a consortium of pension funds, foreign states, on Thursday announcing they would stop the funding the company needs and accuse the water regulator of rendering it uninvestable. Well, should these companies even be in private ownership anyway? It's a commodity, but also it's something we need every day. These companies have two jobs. They are to provide us with clean water through our taps and also to take away the water that isn't clean, but they don't seem to be able to do that. And then they want to increase the bills to such a degree and also give their shareholders yet more money when an underinvestment has been endemic for such a long time. I want to talk to Geoffrey Lean, who is an environmental journalist. Uh, Geoffrey, what do you make of this? Thank you for joining me this morning. Well, it's a scandal on top of a very long-running scandal that's been going. I've been covering for uh, thirty years at least now, since the whole thing was um, was considered in the first place. And um, you know, over the last privatisation was supposed to um, benefit ordinary people, partly by making them shareholders and partly by putting investment into the water system, into sewage works, into providing water, which the state found is hard to do because it competes with a lot of other priorities. Uh, but that's not what's happened. And indeed, some was predicted that what, 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 what was going to happen. Um, over the last year since privatization, water bills have gone up by 360%. At the same time, the debt of water companies has gone up uh, to six. Sorry, when they started, Mrs. Thatcher wrote off their debt entirely. Uh, she gave them five billion um, pounds to start as a completely clean slate. Since then, they have managed, despite rising water bills by three hundred sixty percent, to increase their debt by sixty up to sixty billion, and take out fifty six billion for themselves and their shareholders, while sewage is. A, reached not a single river in England in good ecological condition because of river pollution, largely from water companies. And one-fifth of all the water that's dispatched to us never reaches us because it leaks on the way to get into it. So one-fifth of all, only one drop in, only four drops in five out, out of your tap have actually, um, actually reached you. How, how, so, how difficult, Geoffrey, how difficult can it actually be to run a water company. I mean, this is not about investing in funds. This is about investing in infrastructure. It's about keeping water clean and getting rid of the dirty water. I mean, it just seems to be, I, I, in concept anyway, I've never run a company, but in, in, in concept, a fairly simple thing. Uh, you would have thought so, wouldn't you? Yet and it's and become uh, incredibly complicated and all about profit, which it, it, to me anyway, I'm not a, I'm not a socialist, but I, I, don't, I don't see why privatisation privatization, uh, has, has worked at all. In terms of water companies, we, the, the the benefits just aren't there. I entirely agree. I mean, in some cases it has. You know, I think BT privatisation probably has worked. Well, that, that's but driven I, down prices to a huge degree, and competition has been incredibly important there. BT was basically a monopoly. Yeah, but but you know, the opposite has happened on water, which are monopolies. They can change from monopoly. Yes, shouldn't be part of monopoly. Um, and you know, the um, and there's been some restraint on price rises. Off what? The regulatory body is supposed to keep prices down, but they haven't really succeeded, have they? When you look at what's happened, and it's gone twice as fast as inflation. So, um, you know, you wouldn't think it was difficult. Yeah. And indeed, these these um, these water company chairs are paid millions and millions and millions. Miss one of them paid fifteen million a year. So, you know, it's not exactly underpaid for the little they do. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a it's a big debate. We're going to have it on this program, Jeffrey. Thank you very much indeed. That's Jeffrey Lean, who's an environmental journalist. I want to thank uh, Anne, who says Peter, vital services, particularly water, should never have been privatised. 
and of. Let's talk to Chris in Surrey. He's given me a ring on 0344 499 1000 about this. Chris, you're very welcome to the programme. What do you make about, uh, of not just about Thames Water, but the whole issue of water being uh, privatised? Right, um, I've got a few things to say, Peter. First of all, the checks and balances about um, for, foreign uh, investment into these, into infrastructure companies like water and electric should have been looked at years ago. Um, we, we've, we've, we've built a, a real problem for ourselves. But the, the, the biggest thing, the two things that I want to bring to mention. First of all, years, some years back, about five years ago, the, e, the EPA uh, stopped that's the Environmental Protection Agency, isn't it? Is that its name? Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. They stopped measuring what was coming out of the outfalls and they've left it to the water companies to report it to them. So, with the way they're behaving, do you think they're really giving the real figures anyway? I think it's a lot worse than what they're actually stating. Also, each of those outfalls is supposed to be licensed. Yeah. Okay? Um, there was a, a documentary... Um, the Fergal Sharky and a couple of other well-known water gladiators, if you like. Um, water gladiators, <laughs> love it. Uh, and they found um, in uh, Thames, in Oxford and around that area, they found 1,800 unregistered outfalls. Right. That's illegal outfalls that have never been licensed, never been told to the government that they're on the map. Yes. Um, so th that's a major problem there. Secondly, Thames have got themselves in trouble uh, financially. For years, they've taken, I, I think the figure, I've heard two figures, both of them are indecent, 72 billion or 84 billion in shareholder dividends and director's salaries. All right? Yeah. Since, since, since it, it's got, it's 18 money. billion in debt and one of the country's most complained about suppliers, Chris. Um, it's yeah. also demanding the freedom to pay investor dividends again and wants Offwatt to reduce the fines it pays for sewage spills. I think Offwatt should increase the fines it has for sewage spills and I think no investor in Thames Water should get any dividend until they can guarantee clean water for people in the area. That's, that's my thought on that. I wonder what you think, Chris. I go further than that, Peter. I agree with everything you said there, except give more teeth to Offwatt and also... Do not do a bank-style bailout. Yep. The, the, the water, they have taken the money out and they're asking us to put to increase... But, but what are you, what's the logical... I, I agree with you, Chris, and I don't think we should be bailing out these water companies, but what's the, what's the logical extension of that? If you don't bail them out, the companies fail... Uh, I mean, they, they could quite literally turn the taps off. They're not going to, uh, but no. do you think it should be brought back into public ownership? What do you think? No, uh, well, it depends on how you're going to bring it back. That's what I would, the, the next point. We don't step in. The government does not step in and bail it out now. It lets it go bust. It lets it take the sharehold, no shareholders' dividends to be paid out, to, and, and forensic accountancy to now until the death of it. They reckon they got 12 months' money. Mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. once it's gone bust, all right, we step in. The government steps in. You only, we're only talking about the heads of the, the war. We still need the engineers. We still need the blokes in the street. That won't change. They won't lose a day's work. What we don't do is bail out the shareholders and directors that have bled Thames dry for the last 25, 30 years. OK. Um, strong points there, really good points as well. Chris, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts there. That was Chris in Surrey. Um, quite a few people getting in touch on, on other issues as well, um, I, especially National Service. Charles is in Darlington. He's given me a call on 0344 499 1000. Uh, Charles, you're very welcome to the programme. Uh, what would you like to say about conscription? Good morning. Good morning, Peter. Happy Easter. Thank you. Happy Easter. Well, I was 22 years in the army, and uh, I can tell you I do not believe that in today's society National Service could work. In all my years in the army, I was often told to do things I didn't want to do them. Yeah. But there was no way I could say no to that. When I came out of the army, there was no work, so I got a degree and became a physics teacher in a secondary school. In secondary schools, I can tell you the difference. <laughs> well, you you knew all about young people and their and their attitudes. Then they they would uh, they were perhaps not as perhaps not as uh, disciplined as your colleagues in the army, to put it mildly, Charles. 
Yes, but you could not discipline people in the army today because well, if I was told to, out on a freezing cold day, I had to go and dig a hole in the ground for what seemed to me to be no apparent reason. They I do that, though. Do they do that in the military. I've, I know someone who's, in, who's still in the army, actually. Absolutely. And they just, they're, they're just... They're volunteers. Yeah, and that, that's... volunteers. And, and if you've got people that are being forced into the military, yeah. they're going to turn around and say, no, oh, I'm not going to do that. So how do you make them? Yeah, it's interesting with that big hole thing because I, I know someone who did basic training was at Sandhurst for a couple of years and he told me about digging the big hole and apparently that's something they do and you're just like, why on earth are we digging this big hole? There's no there's no reason for digging the big hole. And then um, he was told at the very end of, you know, a few hours digging a big hole and said, right, fill it back in again. And it's just so, it's just to emphasise that you must follow orders even if they seem completely nonsensical to you, even if they have no... no um, no, no, yeah. no sort of logic. But I mean, your physics students, do you think they would they would do that if they were told to dig a big hole? No, well, you see, the thing is, your friend volunteered to go to Sandhurst. I volunteered to join the army. Yes. But if you start taking people who, if you like, have liberal views, shall we say, and you force them into the army, and then somebody comes and says, dig a hole, and say, why? Yeah. Because I told you to. Well, yeah. who are you to tell me? I'm not doing it. And I can guarantee you one of their mates will be there with a mobile phone <laughs> filming it. Well, and, uh, well, that's that's part of it as well. Um, yeah, it would be it would be very interesting to see uh, Gen Z. We can't just characterise a whole generation, but uh, Charles, I think I think things have perhaps changed uh, since, since in, in, in a while anyway. Charles, thank you very much indeed. That's Charles in Darlington. Give me a ring at 0344 499 1000. That's also the number actually that you can send a WhatsApp voice message. That's what Debbie in Lincolnshire has done in regard to uh, conscription and military personnel. Let's hear what she has uh, sent us on a WhatsApp voice note. We're experimenting with this. So take it away, Debbie. Hi, my name's Debbie. Um, I'm originally from London, but now live in Lincolnshire. Um, I think national service would be good, but then in the next breath, having done uh, time in the uh, Royal Signals and my husband's a 20 year army officer, um, I really think you need people within the military that want to be there rather than people within the military that don't want to be there because it could have a negative effect. But I do think, you know, what is wrong? I've got clients and friends in Greece and they all have to do conscription. Uh, and I just think, yeah, bring it on. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed uh, to um, Debbie and also to her husband for serving this country, as Charles did as well. And really interesting perspective there. That was just a little short little 33 seconds there from Debbie. She made her point really, really well. So thank you to her. Um, uh, quite a few people getting in touch about whether I should join the army. Uh, Karen says, Peter, I think you'd be great in the army. They get you fit, you don't join, you'd be as fit as the fiddle. Uh, give it a few weeks and you'd be up to scratch. Would be the making of you, says uh, Karen with a smiley face. Um, on the British Airways plane we were mentioning earlier in Antigua, this apparently wasn't a one-off, says Amanda, who's been in touch again. She says, we went to Antigua for Easter holidays for many years and it happened every time. Great days. Uh, Dawn says, I guess your dieting will be suspended while you take the important task of sampling Easter eggs. Dawn, um, I'm afraid my friend made me a Simnel cake, you know, the Easter cakes uh, with the with the marzipan on the top of it. And uh, yeah, it's it's a bit like Brexit. It's a it's it's now a historical event. Um, that cake uh, really uh, didn't last long. I think there's a few slices left. I'm giving one to my lovely neighbour Marion at some stage. Uh, Leslie says, can you imagine a sergeant major shouting orders at young conscripts? There would be court cases brought by for bullying and hurt feelings. That is certainly uh, the sentiment that Charles had a minute ago. On birthdays, Penny says, it's my birthday tomorrow, Easter Sunday. Penny, happy birthday for tomorrow. That's Penny in Essex who does get in touch from time to time and thank you for that, Penny. I hope you have a lovely birthday. Uh, as someone else has been in touch and says, good morning, Peter. Sending you Easter blessings. For me, Easter Sunday is Easter Day when Jesus rose again and it is the culmination of Holy Week. Sermon over. About conscription, I would be concerned that those being conscripted would be fully committed, unlike those volunteering. I married a soldier uh, who was... Uh, who, I can't read the rest of that, but I'm, I can't make it out. But he says, I married a soldier. So um, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Martin and... Uh, uh, Os Oswestry, is that how you pronounce it? Oswestry? Yeah, I think so. Um, all privatised companies should be renationalised. Shareholders bleed to the uh, companies dry, so hardly any money is left to make them work properly. I know this firsthand. I work for Royal Mail and I've watched the company get worse and worse. You're not the first Royal Mail employee who said that to me, Martin. Uh, on utility companies, Mick says railways, police, NHS, councils, all broken, but nobody held to account and said the elite get massive bonuses paid for by the public. Nothing will change if water is privatised. I don't know, Mick, maybe lessons could be learned. Get that phrase so much. Oh, we must learn lessons. Um, Waddy Dog has been in touch and says, Hi there, Tech Up Dave. I hope you're well. Please tell Peter the next time he tries to pronounce the Dutch town of Eid. It has two syllables as 
e e Ada and not Eid. It's Ada. Uh, I, was, I was given duff information there. Apologies, but the good news is that at least three of those hostages have been released. We'll keep, um, the situation is apparently ongoing, though. The police in the Netherlands have set us an EDA, uh, which I will get right from now on. Nick says national service should apply to all youngsters who aren't working. They should do national service. So thank you to Nick for that. And you can get in touch as well, 0344 499 1000. The thing we're going to talk about next is a very, very important topic. This is about Scotland's new hate crime laws, uh, which could be used to settle scores according to critics. I actually talked about this a little bit earlier in the week. I was filling in for Julia Hartley Brewer. I had my big boy pants on and was down in the main studio. Uh, but I'm very, very happy to be back up here in the studio I like the best, the radio studio. And uh, this is, is a massive, massive story. And this comes into this new hate crime legislation in Scotland comes into effect on Monday. Uh, it's been called a sort of horrible April Fool's joke. Andrew Neil is in the Daily Mail today saying that the SNP have trashed the schools, the health service and the economy. Now they're set to destroy free speech with a hate crime law that is, as he puts it, an Orwellian nightmare. We'll be talking to someone from the Free Speech Union in just a few minutes and we'll be getting your thoughts as well. If you're in Scotland or even if you're not, give us a call on this 0344 499 1000. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Just want to read out a few tweets. Um, if you send them to at Talk TV rather than to me personally, it means that the team behind the scenes can, can see them and there's more chance that they'll be read out because I only have a very, very brief... Um, it's, it, it's tough presenting a programme. You've got to read a lot of stuff in the breaks. You're not just sitting there twiddling your thumbs or indeed eating Easter eggs. Um, well, thank you to Sean who says, Hi, Peter. I've received my polling card today. Uh, there is still no party who I can vote for. It's a fundamental trust issue. It is like a contract between the citizens and the incoming new government, the party which can provide trust to their citizens will do well. I'm totally fed up with the elections in our country. There is no positive buzz or interest whatsoever. No policy. The elections in America and India have more buzz and flow. What do you think, says Sean in Oxford? Yeah, I think so. I haven't been following the Indian election uh, particularly closely, but certainly the American election is uh, very, very interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Donald Trump is going to be the next president. Uh, uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. And that'll be, you know, that'll be very, very interesting. Uh, never a dull moment with him. Graham from Bushy has tweeted me to say, by removing disabled children or those with special needs, isn't that a breach of the Equalities Act? Um, yes, I think it is probably, Graham. Uh, but we've got to, I suppose, well, no, there's no caveat with that. I'd be really interested to see the, what had happened in the case, certainly of Sally Phillips's son, and they said, well, that's advice from British gymnastics and they needed a GP's letter and so on. I, I think that's maybe just overkill, to be honest, and, and it strikes me as discriminatory, but I'm not an expert in these matters, it just, it's just my opinion. Carol says, uh, we don't look after our military, full stop, the USA makes sure their veterans are housed, ours are left on the streets, no wonder no one wants to join. I know many ex-military here are struggling, if they leave in their 40s, they often can't find work and get nothing. Well, we, need, we just need to do more about this. I mean, there are loads of people with a huge number of skills in our military, but we need to do a lot more. I know Johnny Mercer, the Veterans Minister, is trying. It'll be interesting to see what Labour does uh, when they get in. I think it is a when rather than an F. Um, Anne has been in touch on text. It says, Peter, we've just read the Labour Party members have complained that the Union Jack is ap appearing on electioneering pamphlets representing the far right. So they're unwilling to deliver them. Says it all, doesn't it? Um, Judy says, morning, Peter. We can thank Mrs Thatcher for privatising the water companies along with gas and electricity. I've always felt it was a very bad idea. Water is vital for all civilization, and once in private hands, all that matters is profit. As the Americans would say, go figure. Uh, Terence says, you cannot successfully privatise a de facto monopoly like water. Terence has tweeted me this as well. The absence of any competition for consumers provides the ideal opportunity for corporate shenanigans, for example, stuffing balance sheets with debt and paying excessively large dividends. Lots of people really care about this and something I really care about I know a lot of people not just in Scotland but right throughout the United Kingdom uh, a lot of our viewers and listeners really care about free speech and of course we had that very interesting interview actually I did with uh, Dame uh, oh uh, sorry her name has just completely uh, gone out of my head she did a big report on hate crime and on free speech earlier this week Sarah Khan Dame Sarah Khan has just come back to me um, and uh, in Scotland though new hate crime a law which is uh, coming into force on Monday, could be used to settle scores, according to critics. I want to have a reasonable and free and uh, free speech-led debate on this. We'll talk in a second to someone from the Free Speech Union, but there's a couple of things I just want to play from the First Minister of Scotland, Humza Yusuf, of the SNP first. Let's take a look at the first clip. Look, even if there was vexatious complaints, I'm very confident the police are able to deal with any such complaints. They deal with vexatious complaints, I suspect, on a daily basis. Around the Hate Crime Act, I think every single person recognises that there's been an increase in hatred, not just uh, in the UK, but right across many parts of the world. And that's why a piece of legislation that protects people in some of our most marginalised groups, while at the same time protecting those fundamental values like freedom of expression, I think that legislation is something we should all be proud of. Well, very interesting that Humza Yusuf is saying there that he thinks Police Scotland, his police officers, are equipped to deal with vexatious complaints. And there are worries that people will use this Hate Crime and Public Order Act to actually settle scores as well. There was a two-hour training session for Police Scotland officers that was deemed not fit for purpose by policing unions and by many officers who were on that course as well. So it'll be interesting to see what actually happens with the implementation of this legislation. Let's hear one more thing from Humza Yousef on this as well before we get into the debate. Police deal with vexatious complaints day in and day out. Nobody knows whether there's going to be vexatious complaints as a result of this legislation or not. The point is, of course, that the Act itself has a very high threshold for criminality. Your behaviour has to be threatening or abusive and intended to stir up hatred. That's a pretty th high threshold. On top of that, within the bill, in black and white, explicitly, a freedom of expression protection. So you have every right to insult, every right to offend, every right to criticise and critique. That is 
the cornerstone, a bedrock of our democracy, and that's protected by this bill. People have every right to offend. I just want to keep that clip, and I want to, us to remember what Homsi Youssef has said, the First Minister of Scotland. He has told us that before this legislation becomes law, that people have every right to offend. And no one has the right, no one has the right not to be offended. You could say this shirt is offensive, you could say my hairstyle is offensive, you could say my voice is offensive, and you know, everybody will find something offensive about everything. Lots of people getting in touch on this already. Um, just to remind you, if you want to give me a call on this, 0344 499 1000, you can also send me a WhatsApp message, voice or text on that as well, 0344 499 1000. You can text me, 87222, usual text message with the word talk in it. You can tweet me at talk TV, follow me at Peter Cardwell. Gary has been in touch on text and says, Morning Peter, as, now, as a now former SNP voter for 37 years, I cannot believe the mess they have made. The country is in meltdown and their biggest priority is to kill free speech. That's Gary in Langholm. Thank you for that. Mick in Wallington says, I'm an exiled Scot. This is what happens to a country bribed with free tuition fees and care fees. There's no such thing as a free lunch in a controlling state, says Mick in Wallington. Well, we've heard from uh, Hamza Youssef, the First Minister. I want to hear now from Ben Jones, who's the Director of Case Operations at the Free Speech Union. Ben, thanks for joining me on this. This legislation comes into force on Monday. Hamza Youssef says there's an absolute right to offend, and we need to not worry about this because there has been a massive increase in hate crimes and hate in general therefore this is to safeguard people what do you think of what he has said i think it's telling that the defenders of this absolutely appalling piece of legislation pull back essentially on the argument that it won't be as bad as you think it will be i'm afraid it will be as bad as critics like the free speech union think it's going to be uh, it's fitting that the legislation is coming into effect on april fool's day uh, it was given royal assent almost three years ago and in that time the bill the act, I should say now, uh, is so unwieldy, so impractical, uh, so overly zealous uh, in the desire uh, and the ambition to prosecute people for their beliefs uh, that the police have been saying we simply cannot bring this, we, we cannot enforce this piece of legislation. And even now, senior police officers in Scotland are saying that this is going to be used by vexatious complainants. I mean, my view is essentially that this is going to pour petrol uh, on the already raging fire of cancel culture in Scotland. It is going to be a complete disaster. We had Humza Youssef there saying that he has confidence in the police that they will <laughs> get rid of vexatious complaints. The question is, what is a vexatious complaint when it's to do with people's thoughts and intentions, I suppose. Uh, there's also something I want to ask you about, which is the dwelling defence for saying things in your own home. I entirely believe that people should be able to say whatever they want to say in their own home. But in theory, in theory, stop me if I'm wrong here, but it seems to be that if, you know, you discriminate against someone in their home and say uh, something to, I don't know, your husband, your father, your uh, uncle, whatever, and say you're uh, and say something that stirs up hate. You can then report people for what they say in their homes. And that, that to me seems uh, far too intrusive. Ben, what do you make of that? That's correct. So the Act uh, designates certain characteristics which are protected, so disability, religion, sexual orientation, age. So uh, while removing the dwelling defence, as you've just said, it opens up uh, scenarios where, for instance, uh, somebody could call their husband a grumpy old git, uh, or you could have a situation in which teenage children overhear their parents discussing uh, the trans rights debate and agreeing with J.K. Rowling. Uh, and on uh, either As the vast grounds, majority of people in this country do. Correct. And on either of those grounds, uh, the aggrieved party, the victim, as uh, Police Scotland will now be calling them, uh, can go to the police. They can make a report of a hate crime. Uh, the maximum sentence under the Act is seven years. Even if you are not prosecuted, a non-crime hate incident can be recorded against your name. Uh, that means you might, for instance, uh, for starters, never know that an NCHI has been recorded against you. Uh, you might only discover it when you apply for a job that requires an enhanced DBS check. Uh, for instance, if you want to volunteer uh, or work with uh, children or vulnerable people. Uh, and you might find then that you can't have, you can't take the job, that a job offer is lost because you have this non-crime hate incident recorded against you. So even if you're not prosecuted, and there's every chance you could be prosecuted, the penalties are still severe. To say nothing of the fact that while the police are investigating this, once a hate crime has been reported, they can seize your laptop, your mobile phone, your other devices, uh, and hold them for months, searching for evidence against you just upon receipt of a report. It really will turn Scotland into a house of horrors for freedom of speech. 
we'll see what happens. I just want to give you a flavour of what people are saying. There's a couple of rel relatively long messages here, but just bear with me. Fiona says the hate crime uh, laws being introduced in Scotland on the 1st of April are very worrying. The SNP are actively encouraging people to report what they, the SNP, perceive as hate crime, what many normal people would call freedom of speech. They're encouraging people to report on each other, even private conversations within the home. Uh, ben just made that point. Uh, I've never known a bill that is being promoted via posters and adverts on TV so aggressively and now we find out that the police have a secret file on people who they've deemed guilty of non-hate crimes. People are not advised they are being held on this file. Scotland is now to become a police state. Uh, I wonder what you make of that, Ben. Well, there's been the case that the Free Speech Union has been assisting with uh, in the last week of uh, Murdo Fraser, the Conservative MSP. Um, and he has had a non-crime hate incident recorded against him for the most trivial uh, reason imaginable, as has Rachel McLean, south of the border, uh, the Conservative deputy chair. Um, and, and in these cases, what we're seeing... What is uh, that trivial is, reason? What, what, what was the, the reason for that, no, uh, the, for that uh, non-crime hate incident? In the case of Murdo Fraser, uh, he said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, that it was a nonsense that you could change your gender and said it was basically as meaningful as identifying as a cat. So rubbishing the whole idea of, of gender ideology, as you just pointed out, that's a view that, that many millions of people would share, a majority of people uh, across Britain would agree with. Um, but nonetheless, I, I think it's worth worth noting one other point. I, I, I spoke before about the protected characteristics within the Act. One characteristic that is not protected is that of sex. So transgender identity is protected, but women are not going to be. And I think that's a point worth stressing because women I, I, in Scotland... I, I think uh, I, this is a really interesting point, Ben, and I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. co cognizant of the fact that there are two men talking about this. But nonetheless, it does seem to me that a lot of this type of legislation and moves toward, towards this are actually regressive for many women's groups and for many women's... Other, I, I wonder what women think about this. Maybe you'll let me know, 0344 499 1000. But it does seem to me that it, it, it appears in a lot of this kind of stuff that sexism just isn't the thing anymore. And it, and it absolutely is. I think it's completely bizarre that the uh, Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government at the time basically said that we're going to deal with that issue separately. And it's, it's essentially too complicated to be included in this hate crime act. And I think that um, women in Scotland, particularly women who have been uh, leading the campaign for many years now to protect uh, the spaces and rights of women and girls, have every reason to fear what this act will mean. Um, it, 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 Hamza Youssef was talking about the protections uh, for freedom of speech. There are protections for people who want to criticise religion. So there is a, a particular exemption there uh, that grants uh, extra latitude to discuss, to, uh, to criticise, to debate religion. But that exemption does not apply to questions around transgender identity. So I think that women have every reason uh, to fear what this act will mean for them. We've seen uh, men and women both in their hundreds joining the Free Speech Union uh, in the past week because they're so concerned about what this law will mean in mm. Scotland. Um, and at the very least, it is going to have a chilling effect and people are simply going to feel that it is not worth speaking their mind, it, perhaps even in their own home. Let's talk about one of the most uh, famous people who lives in Scotland, Scottish people who has offended many, many people by, in many people's estimation, including mine, speaking the truth. J.K. Rowling, Leslie has been in touch, says, if J.K. Rowling lives in Scotland, will she have the police knocking on her door if she continues with her gender comments? Jane also says, Morning Peter, isn't it ironic that so much is coming on April the 1st, we're all the fools, but it seems April Fool's Day is happening every day, says Jane. Lots of people really not happy about this, Ben. The Free Speech Union will do everything we can to defend the rights of our members and the people of Scotland. If it's legal to say south of the border, it should be legal to say north of the border as well. But we do have um, devolution and there are different uh, democratically elected governments within those uh, uh, jurisdictions, really. And, and there is different law in Scotland than the rest of the UK on many, many different issues. But I think, as the First Minister himself said, freedom of speech is absolutely fundamental democracy to democracy. And this represents such an assault on freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, to freedom of thought. Um, it's such a disaster uh, that I think, unless it is uh, repealed following the next election, I mean, if that happens, let's say that happens, that could still be two or three years away by the time the Act is actually removed. Uh, in the meantime, 
there could be dozens, hundreds, potentially thousands of people who are prosecuted or who have their devices seized uh, for months on end or people who have non-crime hate incidents recorded against them in the meantime. And so for all of those people, the repeal is going to be too late. So we are going to have to fight this uh, in a very aggressive way in order to defend the rights of people in Scotland to speak their mind. Um, ben, this is uh, kind of a kind of a. I mean, this is a very serious issue, Ben. But I just want to read, <laughs> read you quite a funny message from Adam, who says uh, Scotland is turning itself into East Germany. We let Scotland go off and play on its own, and what do you get? A camper van, and now this. Well, one of the most uh, one of the most darkly amusing uh, points about about the rollout of this act has been that the police have set up these kind of hate crime reporting shops all over the country. Uh, and one of them, I'm conscious of the time at which we're having this conversation, but one of them is in, shall we say, an adult shop. Um, so you can go into this venue and if you have been offended by your husband, uh, offended by your wife, you've been called a grumpy old git, uh, you can go into this adult shop and report a hate crime and claim that you are a victim of hate crime and the police have that promised is, to investigate we're, every we're, complaint. We're through, the, we're through the looking glass, Ben. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Thanks also to Mary in County Down. He says the old GDR Stasi would be proud of the Scottish hate crime laws, reporting people for private conversations in the home. Peak Stasi tactic. Shame on the SNP for this and many other failures of policy and leadership. Hard to disagree with that. Um, let's take a call now on Thames Water. Uh, actually, just before I do, I just want to read it now. A message on Thames Water for someone saying, I don't understand the mentality of those who criticise Thames Water for paying dividends to their shareholders when investors invest invested their money in companies, whether it's water, electricity, football clubs. It's fair to say they expected a good return on in their investments if they fail to get the desired return on investment. What's the logic of them investing in businesses uh, where they reckon are no longer good value for their money? Why would any savvy investors want to risk losing a lot of money in businesses which are no longer viable, which savvy and shrewd investors would want to put money into, uh, would put more of their good money to chase after the bad ones it makes no financial sense for them to do so reality check question mark well i think that actually raises the issue of privatization in general which i know that alan in oxford who's given me a call wants to talk about alan what do you make of this well i don't think privatization of utilities is a very good idea because they're not normal companies are they i mean the utility water particularly is an essential thing yeah um and so it's not really right for people to take a you know it doesn't really work in privatization it doesn't work in nationalisation either because you get the politicians fiddling around with it and this becomes a political football. I think, I don't know if there is an absolute answer, but I would think the best answer is for it to be a cooperative so that, for instance, Thames Water would be owned by the subscribers. So yeah, I, I, a sort of cooperative, uh, sort of user-owned company. I mean, that, that has worked in many places previously. I just think you, you can't inject pure capitalism into something as crucial as the water supply, Alan? No, I absolutely agree. It just doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's a conflict. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is. You say there are lots of examples. I think there are examples. There's one that picked, I picked up on ages ago, and that, and that was in America, in Texas, the Perdinalis Electricity Company, which is a cooperative, Yeah. which became a cooperative because in store, giving electricity to all these farmers scattered all over the countryside was not an attractive proposition for private mm. industry. So eventually it became a cooperative and it's been working since before the Second World War, I think. And, oh, okay. you know, it works fine. I don't see why the water company shouldn't work fine either. I don't see uh, there would be a big problem with it. Yeah. Uh, it'd have to be protected, of course, by a charter so that the politicians can't interfere with it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, th I think that's a very, very good point. Alan in Oxford, thanks for your call. 0344 499 is the... Uh, 499 1000, probably best to complete, complete the number there, is the number that Alan rang. And thank you, very sensible points there. Some breaking news uh, for, uh, again, uh, today. This is in regard to the Netherlands. This is a man has left a nightclub with his hands in the air after police earlier said three hostages had been released who were being held in Cafe Petticoat, which is a uh, popular bar and nightclub um, that is uh, in the Netherlands. We'll bring you the latest on that as we continue with this story. Um, really interesting one. I've just scanned this, but I'm going to read the whole thing now from Tracy. Text from Tracy says, Hi, Peter. Great show. I am a complaints manager lucky you Tracy, uh, vexatious complaints are extremely hard to identify. Each complaint needs to be read, logged, issues determined and a response given as there could be a genuine issue that has not yet been investigated. The risk is that people are labelled rather than heard. Someone can raise an issue but can be seen as vexatious, usually by the same people in a complaints team and so will be discarded. The Scottish law does not serve their population well. That's fascinating Tracy, thank you for that. 
Anne says, I'll come down in a second actually, Alan in Nottinghamshire says, uh, fascism is alive and well with the SNP Gestapo, Alan in Nottinghamshire. Mick says, if police Scotland can refuse to deal with crimes, they can refuse to deal with these alleged thought crimes. And, interesting one on the broader issue, Peter, time to get rid of the devolved parliaments or, uh, or Westminster should withhold funds until these laws are repealed, says Anne. Well, there have been, uh, have been bits of tension, especially on transgender law, between the Westminster Parliament and Scotland, and uh, the Scotland bits of legislation have been enacted to make sure that the devolved parliaments can't do certain things. We're going to talk about all of this tomorrow. We're going to ask the big question, which I think we should have asked a long time ago, and we're going to ask it properly on this programme tomorrow. Does devolution work? I'm talking about elected mayors in places like Manchester, uh, the North East, London as well. Scottish Parliament, Welsh Senate or Assembly and the Northern Ireland Assembly as well. Does devolution actually work? Do you live in an area of the country where there is no devolution? Do you think there should be an English Parliament? We're going to ask all those questions tomorrow. We're going to have a proper debate about it on Sunday's programme tomorrow between 10 and 1. We're going to talk about travel next. Simon Calder is the doyen of travel uh, journalism in this country and he's going to be telling us about the 14 million different journeys that are taking place this Easter weekend. Perhaps you're in the car at the moment listening to the radio we'll find out if you're going to get to your destination faster, slower. Simon knows the issues. Let, stay with us here on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Well, thank you to everybody who's been in touch, including on Twitter. Um, Mick Mox says, uh, what is wrong with our parliamentary representatives? Do they believe in free speech? Unwelcome words a crime. Years ago, I recall a saying that taught me so much it went sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. So thank you to him for that. Bob says, uh, surely the way water was privatised with no competition in each area, no real regulation from off what, is where the problem started, allowing the owners to trouser the debt is criminal. Love that word, trouser. Thank you, Bob. Um, Tub Hitter has been in touch. She says, for those who say reintroducing national service wouldn't have the desired effect, I suggest they rewatch the 1958 film Carry On Sergeant. A spell in the forces can knock the corners off anyone if needed. Um, I haven't seen Carry On Sergeant in a very, very long time. Uh, Graham from Bushy has a, a, a pithy and direct tweet uh, in which he says, off which, off, oh, sorry, off what should change its name to off crap. So there we are. I, I did check with my producer that I'm allowed to say that, and I am. Um, Chris Scott in Nether, Netherine, I think that's how you pronounce it, Netherine on the Hill, says, Human nature changes little through the ages. I fear that hate crime legislation will lead to medieval-style denunciations by people bearing a grudge. In the Middle Ages, to take an extreme example, women denounced as witches could never disprove it and were sometimes burned at the stake. Yeah, well, that's what that play... Um, uh, the Crucible is all about. A um, very, very good play. Uh, I've seen that um, by Arthur Miller, and he was talking about the uh, the Red Scare in the 1950s. It was an allegory. Very, very good play. Um, saw another brilliant play this week, actually, called The Motive and the Cue, uh, which is really good. These NT Live things, National Theatre Live, uh, are really good because you pay less than you would go to the theatre, but you see a theatre performance. Anyway, totally off topic, but absolutely loved it. Um, hi, Peter. Shareholders are being demonised in the Thames Water debate, says Rob. Not all shareholders are, by definition, rich. Putting life savings into shares to have an income to boost pensions, etc., is a perfectly legitimate way of investing your hard earned money. Thames Water bosses are responsible for this mess, not the shareholders, says Rob. Well, Rob, maybe you have some shares in Thames Water. Uh, you're, you're, but, I mean, look, your points are perfectly right. I'm a capitalist. I believe shares are a thing and dividends are fine. I have shares in, in, in uh, one company. Um, but, yeah, I mean, look, I, I just don't know about water. I think it's a, a very, very different very different uh, scenario there. Sasha in Exeter says, uh, regarding Scotland's impending free speech law, if you're visiting Scotland on holiday and were, say, in a cafe with your family or friends and said something which someone else overheard, who thinks what you said was hate speech? I presume you could potentially be arrested even though you don't live there. Yes, Sasha, yeah, if you go to a country and break, break its laws uh, or, or perceived to have broken its laws, yeah, you could be you could be arrested, certainly, absolutely. Uh, Sasha also says, loving the show as always. Thanks, Sasha, appreciate that. Uh, Adam says, isn't a non-hate crime an oxymoron? Uh, it's a fair point. On devolution, Les Leslie says, travel the wheels and keep to 20 miles an hour, go to Scotland and be careful what you say. Well, if you are travelling the wheels, how quickly are you getting there? That is a question we're going to ask Simon Calder because the Easter travel warning is in force. 14 million holiday road journeys, record numbers at airports and major rail works are planned. Um, Simon, it's great to talk to you. How are you doing? Uh, good morning, uh, Peter. Yeah, great to see you. And I'm glad that neither of us are trying to travel because right now it's looking pretty grim out there. Um, the M20, M62 across the Pennines blocked eastbound by an accident. And uh, well, if you're trying to travel to on the West Coast mainline or the East Coast mainline, uh, uh, Dover, um, wherever you are, you are likely to encounter problems. Um, some of them we knew about in advance, some of them are just happening as it always seems to unravel over over Easter. So yeah, um, should, should we start at Dover? Cause, Go for um, it. Go start at Dover and work your way up. Okay, right. So so the problem is that um, since Brexit, when we said we want to be treated as third country nationals, we want to have our passport inspected, we want to be asked, are we, um, you know, have we got enough money for our stay? Where's our return ticket? All those things have to be done because we requested them. Now, um, between the White Cliffs of Dover and the Channel, the Port of Dover only has a very, very small space for French border controls because nobody ever thought, oh, well, what happens if we decide to leave the EU when it was being decide, uh, designed. Well, we now know that you're likely to be having to wait for a number of hours, probably peaking at about two hours today. Um, but unlike the airlines, if you miss your flight, as you know, by five minutes, then you're going to have to buy a new ticket probably. If you're, you miss your ferry because of the long queues for French passport control, don't worry, you will be put on the next available sailing with your company without uh, any having to pay anything. But it's still very, very annoying. Uh, Simon, uh, where else in the country are people having problems? What about the roads? 
OK, so the roads are um, going to be sticky today. The AA actually says that today is going to be the worst part. Oh, I would have thought it would have been yesterday, maybe people well, getting away in the evening and things. Uh, yes, and, and I mean, it was pretty grim, um, but uh, and as was Thursday, yeah, because you had the return from work and the start of the getaway all combining. But the AA says, no, it's going to be worse today because you've got a full football programme. That involves, of course, yeah. some uh, fans travelling hundreds of miles across the uh, country in their hundreds of thousands. And um, people will do what they do on a Saturday, which is go out to out-of-town shopping centres. They will also um, decide uh, that they are going to start their week week's holiday maybe by um, heading off particularly to somewhere like beautiful Lake District or Cornwall and Devon and it's going to be in those areas you're going to see the worst uh, expected problems but on top of that things like closing the M62 is just one of those things which pops up and we've seen quite a lot on that railways uh, if you wanted to get to Wales from um, London, for example, where it's been proving very, very difficult by train. We had all sorts of problems with the Great Western region pretty much over the last 48 hours. Um, and now if you were going by train to uh, f from, well, let's say mid Wales or North Wales to London, that's going to be tricky because the West Coast main line is completely closed at uh, Euston Station, um, which means that effectively the West Midlands, North West England, North Wales, Southern Scotland are not accessible directly. And if you're going from Scotland to London, you might think, well, that's all right. I'll go on the East Coast Main Line via Newcastle and York. Not so fast. Uh, there's a points failure. There's all kinds of problems between Newcastle and Durham. So lots of cancellations and okay. curtailments and delays, I'm afraid. Simon, thank you. Appreciate that. Simon Calder there, uh, travel guru, travel correspondent of The Independent with an update there. Just time for a quick call from Lynn in Glasgow on water charges. Lynn, I'm sorry we're running out of time rapidly towards the break, but what point would you like to make? Yeah, well, our, my repeat and what a great show. Thank you. Our water charges up here are included in with our council tax bills. So it's, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I'm a band C, so I pay £224 a year for my water supply. And I'm just wondering, when you're talking about Thames, well, how much are, are they actually charging people? Well, like, I, is I, there a massive, you know, I hear about the 40% increase, in it, but it doesn't actually tell you kind of typically what. Yeah, well, I'll just doing. tell you. I just tell you, I'm a customer of Thames Water. I live in a small flat. Um, I pay, I think, it's sixty five pounds a month. Right. Well, I'm in a three bedroom house, and my water supply. We do pay extra for sewage. That's a mm -hmm. separate charge. Yes, yeah, it's, it's all together with the water charges that that I pay anyway. I don't know what it's like for everybody else, but it's all one charge. I think that I think it's roughly about the same for the sewage as well. But I pay two hundred and twenty four pounds a year for my water supply, and I'm not. Like, I, it's not that I need to watch what I'm using or yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have a meter. People people have meters as well. But, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, different things in different parts of the UK as well. Do you think that's fair, Lynn? I, I suppose that goes into your whole thing about what you're talking about tomorrow, which is going yeah. to be absolutely amazing to watch. <laughs> right, well, thank you, Lynn. We'll, we'll certainly talk about it. And do give us a call tomorrow if you want to get in on that. Uh, Neil has actually been in touch on the devolution chat tomorrow. He says... Peter, this could be your shortest topic ever. Does devolution work, including mayors? No, 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 says Neil in the doomed 20 mile an hour people's non democratic Republic of Wales. Uh, Marion Cody Down says, I regard, as do many people, the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is anti Semitic. Under the new law, will the police in Scotland take action against the thousands of people chanting this on the streets of Edinburgh and Glasgow? I suspect not says Mary in uh, County Down. Well, thank you for that. We will uh, follow that. We will talk about that. We'll talk about devolution and different laws in different countries, different ideas as well in terms of how countries should be run and different parts of England as well. That's our devolution chat tomorrow. We're talking about Northern Ireland next here on Talk TV 2. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl. 
When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. That was the woke that was 10 o'clock Saturday night. We've got Pete Barnes, we've got the lovely Lois Perry, and we've got YouTube sensation Pearl Davis. Have a hot cross bond. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, a very good afternoon. This is Talk TV. I'm Peter Cardwell. Thank you very much indeed for your company today. We've had a really spirited debate about a number of issues. Hate crime legislation. We're going to be talking about Northern Ireland properly in a minute. We tried to do it earlier unsuccessfully. Uh, we've also been talking about Thames water and water privatisation in general. I want your views. There's still plenty of time between now and one o'clock when Deanna Davidson takes over. She is uh, here between one and four. 0344-499-1000 is the number to call. Uh, you can either ring me or you can send me a, a WhatsApp message on that number as well, either a text message or a voice message. We'll be hearing one of those in a minute. 0344-499-1000 is that number. Text messages, good old-fashioned text messages, 87222 with the word talk in your text. You can tweet me at Talk TV or follow me as well. Follow me on Twitter at Peter Cardwell and uh, get all the updates throughout the week on all sorts of things like the politics I cover as chief political commentator for this station as well. I want to thank uh, lots and lots of people for being in touch. We're going to, as I say, listen to one of those WhatsApp messages in a second and talk about Northern Ireland. Loads to talk about this hour as well about, uh, we're talking about the Beck Off, we're talking about a hugely popular show segment could be axed as desperate Brits face a chocolate shortage and soaring prices. We're talking about this with the Easter chocolate crisis. Uh, Chalky Horror says the sun worldwide chocolate crisis looming after the price of cocoa trebled to an all-time high. And actually, if you think the price of chocolate was high, well, we've sent our intrepid tech up Dave out into the world and he has found the cheapest and best value Easter eggs for you. And believe me, we will be sampling them in great depth later on. We may even have Deanna in to try some of that as well. Uh, so lots to discuss. I want your calls, texts and tweets. As I say, main number, give us a call 0344 499 1000. Stay with me here on Talk TV between now and one. It'll be great to have your company. Lots to discuss.
Well, Northern Ireland has been uh, fascinating in the last few days because the leader of the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, it's the biggest pro-union, biggest unionist party, and its leader, Geoffrey Donaldson, has been an MP for Lagan Valley, uh, that's his constituency outside Belfast, since 1997. There aren't too many MPs in Parliament who've been there since 1997. Well, massive political earthquake because on a Thursday he was arrested alongside a 57-year-old woman. They have now been charged with 10 offences, including in Geoffrey Donaldson's case, rape. And that has meant that he has resigned, of course, as leader of the D DUP. He's still an MP. He's been suspended by his party, so he's now an independent MP as well. Uh, we're, we'll talk a bit, of course, about the uh, charges against him, but this is an active court proceeding, so we need to be really, really careful about that. And actually, the police have said to people to stop speculating online about this because the last thing uh, anybody should do, and of course it's illegal, would be to prejudice a court case. But there are massive political ramifications as well uh, for this. No better person to talk to than Amanda Ferguson, who is a journalist in Northern Ireland. Amanda, thank you for joining us this afternoon on Talk TV. What an incredibly interesting Thing. Uh, very difficult, of course, uh, but also seismic events, both politically and indeed uh, legally in Northern Ireland. I want to get into the politics in a second, but I just want you to take us through what we can say about what has happened to Geoffrey Donaldson over the past uh, few days legally. Tell us, tell us what uh, what's the, the latest we know on those charges and what has happened. Okay, well, uh, we know that uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson and another um, were arrested, that uh, they face charges that are part of a, a live investigation for police and an ongoing uh, criminal justice uh, process. So Sir Geoffrey Donaldson um, sent a letter to the DUP telling them that he was resigning as party leader uh, because of these historical um, charges that he is facing and he was immediately suspended then as a DUP member. Now, we uh, know that uh, Gavin Robinson uh, was then unanimously uh, made uh, interim party leader and um, he's interested in leadership enough that he's been the deputy leader of the party up until this point he's been the deputy for um, not even a year and uh, what happens next uh, remains to be seen we know that uh, the the court case um, that uh, will be involved in uh, Sir Geoffrey is going to have its first hearing uh, next month. And in the meantime, uh, political um, actors from across the spectrum in Northern Ireland are really trying to focus in on um, keeping Stormont functioning. You know, obviously, this is something that is a big earthquake for the DUP. You could tell from Gavin Robinson's interview yesterday that he was in shock at the at the revelations and at the um, allegations. And there's there's a, there's much uh, to flow from this we, we next. Actually look at a little bit of that interview that was with the senior Ireland correspondent of Sky News, David Blevins. Let's see what Gavin Robinson, and this guy is also a member of Parliament, he's the MP for East Belfast. He was the deputy leader of the DUP until yesterday, he's now its interim leader. Uh, fascinating interview, we're just going to play about a minute of this just to get a flavour of how Gavin Robinson has been reacting to that news about his former party colleague Geoffrey Donaldson. Let's play this clip. I think it's been a devastating revelation and has caused tremendous shock, not just for myself personally or my colleagues within the DUP, but for the community right across Northern Ireland, it came as a great shock. Um, but we are a party and individuals that believe in justice. We have faith in our criminal justice system. Uh, and so in the coming days and months, I think it is important that none of us say anything or act in any way uh, that would seek to prejudice what is now an ongoing criminal investigation. And very late last night, uh, the party became aware um, whenever it was revealed uh, publicly that there had been an individual uh, and another charged um, and it became clear to us who that individual was. Um, in the early hours of this morning, we took steps to make sure we could bring colleagues together, uh, discuss what it was uh, we had learned uh, and take the appropriate steps uh, that we could, uh, as you know, um, Jeffrey Donaldson has stepped down as party leader. Um, he has indicated that to us, but through our disciplinary process, we similarly had to take uh, the steps to suspend him from party membership until the conclusion uh, of what is now a live criminal investigation. 
That is Gavin Robinson, the interim leader of the DUP, talking there. He, when he was referring to yesterday, of course, he was referring to Thursday because that interview was recorded yesterday. I want to get into the politics in a minute, Amanda, but, of course, the PSNI police service in Northern Ireland has been saying that people should... I mean, there's so much speculation online. We're obviously not going to get into that for legal reasons, but already a warning, not just from the police service in Northern Ireland, but from Gavin Robinson in that as well, not to prejudice that, that court case. Yeah, I think that's hugely important. Obviously, a complainant in a case such as this is entitled uh, to anonymity. And uh, the, there's been a frenzied online commentary um, since the revelations came into the public domain. I think people are, are losing track of days here because it's been a, a real whirlwind. Obviously, there are people's lives at the centre of this, um, but the, the focus should be on uh, protecting the integrity of a live police investigation and a criminal justice process. And of course, um, as political journalists, we can pick over the detail of what it means for the DUP. Well, well let's, let's do that right now, um, Amanda. Um, Gavin Robinson is the interim leader. They'll, there will now presumably be a leadership election for the DUP, a very fractious one, uh, two actually leadership elections uh, just about two and a half years ago. Um, what do you think will happen now? Because there is a sort of Jeffrey Donaldson wing, isn't there? Uh, he brought people through the problems in regard to the protocol, the uh, the Windsor framework, for example, took sort of a leap of faith. It was called Jeffrey's deal to get, uh, go to get government back up and running in Northern Ireland, although he remained at Westminster as a DUP MP. Uh, but could that could that uh, perhaps be at risk now in regard to Northern Ireland's government? And what do you think will happen? And who do you think will run in regard to the DUP leadership, Amanda? I think that it, that it could be. Obviously, whenever the Stormont was restored, it was Jeffrey's deal. The party officers weren't unanimous in wanting to go back to Stormont. So I think Gavin Robinson wants to try to stabilise the party. However, there may be opponents of the Windsor framework and the post-Brexit trading arrangements who make a power play for leadership. Uh, it depends uh, what the DUP want to do. Do they want another contest? Do they want to provide continuity uh, in Gavin Robinson, a continuation uh, of government? And I also think that it, it sort of wakes the, the first the deputy first minister's position a little bit in that Emma Little Pengelly was very much seen as Jeffrey's pick uh, for deputy first minister. She's obviously an unelected uh, MLA. What happens that, internally? That, 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 I think a lot of viewers and listeners in England, Scotland, and Wales will find that quite weird. So just to clarify, we uh, we were in a situation where Jeffrey Donaldson ran. Stop me if I'm wrong here, Amanda. Uh, ran for to be an assembly member in Lagan Valley, the constituency where he was and indeed still is an MP, was elected as an assembly member for the Northern Ireland Assembly, immediately stood down, gave it to someone else, uh, who's Emma Little Pengelly, who previously has been uh, a, an MP and an assembly member, and she's been uh, a special advisor and so on, well qualified, but nonetheless unelected. And now she is the joint leader of Northern Ireland. Yeah, that, you know that that that's right, Peter. I know that's something that hasn't sat comfortably. It's within the rules um, to be able to co-opt someone into a seat, and they don't have to be an elected person. Uh, but I just think that her position is a little uh, bit vulnerable in the context that we're dealing with. Because Obviously, it's so linked to Jeffrey Donaldson, as I suppose Gavin Robinson would be someone, the interim leader, very much a a, a fan and friend of Jeffrey Donaldson politically, anyway. Although things have changed dramatically in the last little while. I mean, how do you think that leadership election will go? Amanda. Yeah, well, obviously, Gavin Robinson was someone that, that led Sir Jeffrey Donaldson's leadership campaign. So they, they're on the same wing of the DUP as such. Uh, what happens on the other side of things remains to be seen. It'll be interesting if we perhaps hear from Lord Dodds, if we hear from Sammy Wilson, if we hear from um, some other senior figures who so far haven't really said anything, perhaps for obvious reasons. But that isn't going to be a position uh, that's going to be tenable in the time ahead. I think the DUP will welcome the fact that this is the Easter weekend and it gives Gavin Robinson Robinson and the party officers time to regroup and work out exactly what's going to happen next. But you have heard from the other political parties in Northern Ireland that they want just the continuation and continuity of government, which has only been back for you know a number of weeks. Uh, and I'd imagine after the Easter uh, recess that we'll probably see a flurry of legislation starting to be introduced. Yeah, it's interesting actually on that because, uh, of course, sta stable stable devolution in Northern Ireland is certainly what the majority of people want to happen. Although tomorrow actually we're talking about devolution and whether it actually works. We're going to have a whole debate on that, including with voices from Northern Ireland. But I wonder about the impact on unionism more broadly because Geoffrey Donaldson didn't just lead the DUP. He was the leader of unionism more broadly. Of course, he was originally a member of the Ulster Unionist Party many years ago before falling out and leaving that party. But, I, I mean, there are implications 
tensions there in terms of the union itself with huge and growing calls for referendums on both sides of the border. If Mary Lou Macdonald, the president of Sinn Féin, becomes Taoiseach, uh, the Prime Minister of Ireland, there may well be some sort of referendum or move towards it there, perhaps. I mean, this is this is not just about political events. This is uh, in terms of Northern Ireland per se, but this more broadly could be seen about the union as well. Oh, it definitely is. You know, the political landscape across the island of Ireland uh, is changing, if, as you've just reflected in your remarks. And for unionism, it's in a difficult position. It's not in a dominant uh, era of unionism. Everyone knows that Northern Ireland was created with an inbuilt unionist majority. The Sinn Féin emerging as the largest party wasn't something that people thought was was going to happen, but it has happened. Um, and the the idea that, you know, power sharing, um, you know, is still a good model. I think most people would agree with that. And there has been support uh, for the parties to head back to Stormont. But it's been a very um, fractured system of government that uh, it's been a stop-start system of government because it's a mandatory coalition and you're having people who are kind of diametrically opposed on most issues having to, to work together to try and deliver for people who want different outcomes. Now, the political conversations around Irish reunification and maintenance um, of the union have accelerated post-Brexit and that's something that's likely to continue uh, in the years ahead. So unionism doesn't have a majority Majority anymore. Um, it's it's gone through uh, various sort of difficult uh, years, and really the focus should be now for unionist leaders to really think about how they can sell the benefits of the union. Because I'm I'm not sure that unionist leaders have always been very good at reaching outside of unionism to appeal beyond its own base because it's something that they've never had to do before. But we're in an era now, and to put it really crudely, the demographics show that they're going to have to do that. But that's fascinating as well, Amanda, isn't it? And maybe you would paint a picture. When I'm talking about this, I'm chief political uh, commentator of the station as well. What I always try to say when people think of Northern Ireland, the old way, maybe you'll agree with this, maybe you won't, the old way of looking at it was just straightforwardly unionist versus nationalist Republican, uh, just two sides, essentially. Now there are three because the others are a lot more as well. The Alliance Party, the Centrist Party, doing much better than it did a lot of younger people who don't have particularly strong views on the union per se. And actually, with both unionism and nationalism in a minority, it's those in the middle, those on the other side that would be convinced by lots of different things moving in different directions. And for many people, Geoffrey Donaldson, to some of those others, was seen as someone who was perhaps perhaps seen as a little bit more reasonable, maybe, than people like the Firebrand Ian Paisley or even his successor, Peter Robinson. But I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about those, those others, where they come from, who they vote for, and really the fate of Northern Ireland in terms of the union could be in their hands, couldn't it? Yeah, well, you know, we know that Alliance has had an electoral presence for over 50 years, but it certainly emerged as the third major electoral force after the 2022 uh, Assembly election. The the challenge that you have in, in, in analysing a cross-community party that doesn't take a fixed constitutional position is that if you're, you know, dividing us up into who's who, roughly 40% Unionist, roughly 40% Irish Republican, and then 20% of these others who vote for Alliance or vote for the Greens Party or, or vote for for other um, independent candidates. But within uh, that cohort, you will have people who are British unionist minded, people who are Irish Republican minded. You'll have some people who don't really uh, care or aren't that fussed on the constitutional question or who could be persuaded either way. So they're going to be very important whenever a border poll is eventually call called in Northern Ireland. Obviously, the, the Good Friday Agreement um, settled uh, the sort of constitutional question for a while in that for the first time, uh, people accepted that Northern Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, but it is a conditional part of the United Kingdom for as long as people want it to be. So the union is maintained uh, by democracy. If people don't want that anymore and want to vote for something different, that is up to them. So in the time ahead, that battle uh, will be for that middle ground uh, cohort who people aren't really sure what way they're going to vote. However, recently polling is indicating um, that uh, quite a significant percentage of Alliance voters are in favour uh, of Irish unity either now or at some point in the future. So the unionism has an uphill, uphill battle um, ahead, but regardless of what happens in the future, whether it's a united Ireland or maintaining uh, the union with Britain, we're all still going to have to live here, apart from a few people who might uh, leave the jurisdiction. 
transition, everyone's still going to be here with different identities and nobody's going to be forced to be something they're not. But uh, certainly there's uh, turbulent times ahead and perhaps sometimes the, the border pool question can be framed in a way that it's divisive, but democracy shouldn't be viewed as divisive if, if people uh, thoughtfully outline their positions, give people the facts, give people their pitch and offering, and then it's up to the people to decide. And I think really that republicanism and unionism have to accelerate their offer and really um, coherently outline exactly what it is that people are going to be voting for, uh, because it's all to play for at the moment. But the, the sort of trajectory is pointing uh, towards um, the union being in trouble in the years ahead. And in terms of those communicators, I don't want to talk any more about the court case. We'll leave that to one side. But uh, I, th I think, and perhaps you'll disagree, but I think that Jeffrey Donaldson, certainly over his 40 plus years in politics, as someone who worked for Enoch Powell, as someone who was an Ulster Unionist MP, and someone who was the leader of the DUP, was at the very least a, a, a communicator, someone who brought people with him politically, and was a probably at the height of his powers until he was arrested on Thursday morning. I wonder if you agree with that assessment, Amanda. I think that Jeffrey Donaldson, um, as the UP reps go, um, is mild mannered in comparison to some of his colleagues, but he's still a pretty hardline uh, unionist in terms of his policy and the the, the whipping of uh, politicians, uh, you know, for, for particular lines, socially conservative, uh, and so on. I think that the the shock waves of this story um, are most acutely felt, obviously, by the people at the centre of it. But it does have political ramifications because he's an MP. It doesn't mean that Stormont's going to collapse overnight. No, nowhere near. Yeah set of circumstances but we are in a turbulent time at a fragile stage in the restoration of Stormont it's only been uh, up you know for a matter of weeks and we're now facing into one of the most significant uh, political uh, stories that has emerged in Northern Ireland in recent years. Amanda thank you very much indeed first class analysis there from Amanda Ferguson in Belfast thank you very very much indeed to her um, I want to play another WhatsApp voice note you can send them on 0344 499 1000 to WhatsApp as well as ring us this one is from Tina Shamley uh, who is um, in uh, I'm not sure where she is actually but her name's Tina Shamley and um, thank you for the message here she goes I just wanted to talk about conscription and um, all of the previous comments that have been coming through with regards to youth going into the army and not really wanting to be there and the negative impact that it might have on them and, and others. Um, would it not be the case that they would be put into, I, I don't really know the term, but teams and um, if they don't com comply, if they don't um, toe the line, then their whole team is penalised, in which case they start getting punished by their peers. That would soon bring them into line and also maybe give them a sense of regard for other people. Tina, thank you for that. That's Tina who has been in touch on conscription. We've got to continue to talk about that and also over the price of chocolate. Uh, also, uh, that is chalky horror, says the front of the sun. Uh, the British Bake Off has threatened to axe a TV special on chocolate because it's just so expensive. But actually, Tech Up Dave has been out buying cheap, the cheapest chocolate he can find. And he's uh, unsurprisingly for Tech Up Dave gone to uh, a huge efforts to do so. We'll be talking to him a little bit later. But we're going to talk to uh, the consumer champion Adrian Mills next on this. Uh, I also want to thank Andrew who has WhatsApp me to say Welsh Water was privatised in 1989. The original model didn't work. We now have a not-for-profit model which is run from Wales with no shareholders. Much of the profit is reinvested in the infrastructure. I pay £15 a month as I live in Wales. Um, I live and work for uh, Welsh, Welsh Water apparently. So Andrew, thank you for that. Um, £15 a month, I would be very happy. My water bill is about £65 a month um, and of course there are many parts of the UK including Northern Ireland and Scotland where they pay uh, in a different way for it as we heard from Lynn a little bit earlier. Uh, we're going to talk more about conscription, about chocolate, and we're going to be trying some chocolate with Tech Up Dave in just a few minutes here on Talk, uh, here, here on, not on Tech Up Dave, here on Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Thank you to everybody who's been in touch on conscription and lots of other topics as well. And uh, yeah, we're talking about chocolate as well. Chucky Horror says the uh, sun, Easter chocolate crisis, Brits facing a shortage as prices soar. The Bake Off uh, has threatened to axe its chocolate TV special. Poor weather and crop disease in West Africa has led to shortages with manufacturers warning of further price hikes. Well, Tech Up Dave has been on the trail this week and he has been trying to find the cheapest uh, eggs that we can find. He's been to all the different supermarkets, Aldi and uh, Lidl, uh, as you would imagine, but also Sainsbury's and elsewhere. He'll also be solving the mystery of why you are apparently not allowed to bring a Cadbury's cream egg on a plane, uh, which was a new one to me. But James Max, my colleague, uh, who's a presenter here on Talk TV, as I'm sure you know, has uh, tweeted a picture and put this on Instagram of uh, Tech Up Dave, which I'm, I'm going to show you now, which is him in the studio uh, with a silly hat on and uh, holding an Easter egg thing and generally just being a bit eccentric and fun and smiling. And uh, various people have said he's lost it, called security, sleep deprivation does this to us all. Um, and then Adrian Mills has put eccentric. Uh, so, yes, Adrian Mills is actually our next guest. He is a consumer expert. And I think we can all agree that uh, that uh, Tech Up Dave has been eccentric in what he has done there. So let's talk to Adrian about the cost of chocolate on Channel 4 Chiefs considering axing the Bake Off's much-loved chocolate week amid the global coca shortage. Adrian, thank you for joining us on Talk TV. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Can I just say, I've raced back here, which is why I look a bit flush, from my local gym... And get this, it tells you why we're all chocoholics in this country, is that the people that go to the gym have left Easter eggs for the trainers. Now, that Brilliant. doesn't encourage... Brilliant. Maybe they're just jealous of the trainers being all sort of fit and healthy and muscly and actually want to make them, you know, a bit podgy like the rest of us. Not that I'm obviously... Obviously, you're a, a vision a vision of, of health and so on, but uh, I am not. No, but the, the, there is a problem. We, we are addicted to chocolate. We yes. all love chocolate. Um, interesting enough, Dave finding the cheapest chocolate may not be the best for your health. Because I met somebody the other day who was having milk chocolate with her little boy, and she said, oh, but it's milk chocolate. I said, no, no, it's 
packed, rammed full of sugar. Yes. And if you want a healthy chocolate, then I'm afraid it's 70% cocoa. Yeah, but it's chocolate. it's 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 just not very nice, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, I can't. Some people like uh, that very heavy cocoa dark chocolate and stuff, but I just I don't know. I'm just a, a sucker for the for the milk stuff. But, but um, sorry, Adrian, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, there is going to be a crisis down the line because one tonne of chocolate, cocoa, right, now costs over £7,500 per tonne. And that is an increase over the short period of time of 350%. Goodness now, me. if you're going to pay your farmers a good price for producing this, uh, and they can't produce it because of global warming, because of a thing called uh, black fog rot, which has uh, basically just completely destroyed a lot of the crops. And that's across Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, the Ivory Coast. Who's going to end up paying for it? Yeah. The consumer. Well, there's, there are, have, have been extreme weather in West Africa's cocoa-producing countries, experts warning the cheap chocolate era is over. Should we just, as a consumer expert, um, just say, look, you know, chocolate is more expensive, Adrian, that's life? Oh, very good. Uh, chocolate uh, Chocolate is a luxury. We all love it. We are addicted to it. If I look in my fridge behind me, my wife does a lot of baking. She makes the most amazing chocolate brownies. So my fridge is round full well, of That's why you have to go to the gym, Adrian. Oh, well, I, I tell you. But there's also the problem with, because we've had inflation, but you've got to think of shrink inflation. And I guarantee that the eggs that you were buying five years ago, three years ago, have shrunk in size. They've shrunk in thickness. They've shrunk in content. And to put it into perspective, my wife used to always buy me a chocolate egg that was about the size of my head. This is this year's offering. Right, you're, you're holding up, I should say to your, for radio listeners, you've got one of those sort of cream egg size ones. But there are, I mean, shrinkflation is a thing. People are always uh, texting in about the size of wagon wheels. And uh, cream eggs are definitely smaller than they were. Or maybe just my hands got bigger. I don't know. No, no, but everything, I mean, as I said, my wife does a lot of baking. Just even ordinary eggs, forget chocolate ones. You can try and buy a pack of 12, you can't. They're packs of 10. Yes. So it, it's something that we should all be annoyed about because there's definitely, in my opinion, some form of profiteering going on here by suppliers and supermarkets. Uh, but the chocolate thing, yes, it's like everything. The price of a coffee used to be, you know, £1.52 yeah, five yeah, yeah. years ago. £3.50 now. It, these are the things that we adore, we love, I actually... we want. And we're prepared to pay. Do you know what? I was in a bagel shop the other day, and well, a few weeks ago, and there was one that had opened in a station. And usually in railway stations, things tend to be a little bit more expensive as they are in airports anyway. But I got literally a bottle of water, and I ordered a bagel, a salmon bagel. And they said, that'll be £10, please. And I thought, uh, no, it won't, and walked out of the shop. Uh, but, I mean, Mar Mars Bar chocolate eggs, even last year, they're 252 grams. Now they're 201 grams. Yes, yes. And a lot of people won't notice it because the packaging may well have increased. It's the egg itself that shrunk. And if you're a child and you see a really large box, you think, oh, wow. But when you open it up, you think, well, actually, this egg is quite minute. And I guarantee yeah. the contents, which you may have had a dozen chocolates in, will now be down to perhaps six or eight. Absolutely. Adrian, we will keep an eye on this. Thank you very much and happy Easter to you. That's Adrian uh, Mills there, who's a consumer expert. We'll be talking about this with Tech Up Dave in just a few minutes. He has uh, been scarring the uh, different uh, supermarkets for the best value and cheapest eggs as well. We are also uh, heard this week from an NHS doctor saying, don't eat a whole Easter egg in one go. We'll be ignoring that advice and uh, eating lots and lots of eggs. And uh, Dave says he has a workaround of that. Um, on... Um, uh, national service and indeed on uh, water as well. Rob in Hollywell has been in touch and says, Peter, what part of Wales did the guy who paid £15 a month live in? I live in Flintshire and I pay £67 a month. That's about what I pay, Rob. Uh, I don't know where that guy lives who pays £15 a month, but um, maybe he'll text back and let us know. Amanda has said, Peter, the lady who just sent you a voice message about conscription, conscription was spot on about out-of-control youths being put into teams to learn and bond. You see this in London streets with kids joining gangs, says Amanda. Brian is in Blackpool and has been waiting patiently to make his point on national service and um, Brian tell us what you think about this well I did national service I did in England I did national service in Israel now national service in England I was actually in the Irish Fusiliers okay and our sergeant training sergeant turned around and says we build a new person we break the old one yes now, as far as Yankers is concerned, if somebody... we Remember, we had mods and rockers. Yes. And they were terrible, some of them. 
they you could not control them at all. But national service was maybe a way of of controlling them a little bit. Exactly. Why, why did you do national service in Israel, Brian? If you don't mind me asking, have you got a historic link there or a family link? No, I, I went there because of anti-Semitism in the sixties. Goodness, I'm so and sorry I to hear that. On the kibbutz, and I was called up uh, in the Six Day War. Wow, you, you fought in the Six Day War. My goodness, what was it like living in a kibbutz? Absolutely fantastic, pure communism. It worked <laughs> brilliantly till all of a sudden you realise you don't own anything. Yes. You have to ask a committee if you want something. If you want an electric kettle, it had to go before a committee. Right. And they would say if you could have it or not. You didn't even have your own clothes. You didn't have your own clothes? The clothes were owned no, collectively? It's collectively, yes. Everything, everything was collectively. You, you did a, a round job. Everybody at some time worked in the fields, in the laundry, in the kitchen. It didn't matter if you were a doctor, a scientist, a dustman. You all did exactly the same work. And how long did you spend on the kibbutz? I was there for nearly four years. I came back and I took up my profession as a London cab driver. Mm -hmm. And in 73, it happened again. And I went back and my wife went back and we, because we were reservists. Goodness me. Wow, what a story. Brian, thank you very much for that. That's Brian in Blackpool. Um, thank you for that. that lot, he's packed, packed a heck of a lot into his life there. Um, Daniel is in Shropshire. I understand you served this country in the army as well, Daniel. Yeah, so I spent six years um, with the Royal Tank Regiment. Um, and this whole national service thing, I mean, yes, it would work. But I do believe that it should be reserved for young offenders, especially those between the age of 16 and 20, because a lot of these may be people who've had extremely rough upbringings with no sense of purpose, no sense of structure, and the army is the perfect place for that. Um, and also, I believe it should be used for the large amounts of young fighting age males that are coming across in the small boats because it would work as an amazing deterrent mm. you know if you yeah if you, if you come across you've got to got to serve the country and that, that's an interesting one because a lot of the immigration argument is about fairness as well uh, people receiving the benefits of living in the uk i'm not talking about the benefit system per se but just the benefits of living in the uk without actually having contributed but if those people had contributed to our armed forces for example that might change the conversation a little bit yeah, because if you said to them at the shores or, it, or before they came across, right, if you come across in the small boat, you're going to go straight to Cattery mm. and do three years national service, you're going to see a lot less of them coming. It would be. I mean, that's a really, really interesting idea. It's interesting with the young people who are perhaps young offenders are getting into trouble. I mean, I know historically people were told, look, you're either going to a Borsal or a young offenders institution or whatever you want to call it, or you can go into the army, your choice. And if I was in that situation, I know what I would choose. Oh, yeah, definitely. But it's like the whole, um, the one thing the army needs to get a grip on and tell the government or Stonewall to get to just get lost is this whole DEA... Uh, Diversity, uh, equality and inclusion, yeah. is that right? Yeah. But the thing is, though, you know, in the six years I was in, I met soldiers who were gay of all different skin colours, of all different religions. And the thing when you get to basic training, and this is what your training team will always say to you when you get to basic, is while you are here, until you graduate, you are all equally yeah. worthless. <laughs> You're all equally worthless. Wow, well, that, that, that's one form of equality. Yeah, and this is the thing, because you're being trained by guys who have seen combat, who have lost friends, who have taken lives. These are tough combat veterans who will not take any any form of rubbish from entitled young... I mean, if you went, if you had a youngster who was, say, 18 years old, go to their corporal, their two sergeant, corporal, can you use my pronouns? Yeah. They will take you outside and beast you until you learn some respect. Yeah. Your pronouns are you're a sniveling piece of rubbish and you'll do what I say, I would imagine yeah. the corporal would say. Yeah, I mean, we had a lad in my basic trait because the thing with the army is you have blanket punishment. If one of you messes up... You ah, that's good for bonding people together, isn't it? Yeah, and the thing is, we had one lad in my basic, and I'm going back a long time, uh, back in, what, 2011, we had a lad who just kept, who, he was bone idle, he was lazy, he wouldn't do anything. And we, and for about four weeks straight, all 29 of us were being punished repeatedly, and I mean brutally punished, not right. beatings or anything like that. I mean, we would be taken outside, 
we would be marched around the parade square for six, seven hours at a time. You know, we would be. I, I, I just couldn't do that. I couldn't. I couldn't be part of that system, yeah. Daniel. I'd be rubbish. I'd, I'd be. I'd be the guy. I'd be the guy you were complaining about. Yeah, but this is the thing. We had, and it was all because of this one guy. Mm. Now, you know, I'm going to say something a bit controversial, but um, but basically, what happened was, our training staff went look. This guy is making your lives hell. We yeah. don't want to keep beasting you. Yes. So we're going to pop out, and if he has an accident, oh, goodness. he doesn't see anything. And the next day, that guy was gone. Wow. Okay, Ho hopefully it wasn't too serious an accident. I mean, I don't, I'm not advocating any form of form of uh, anything illegal, obviously, but that was, that well, was the way to deal with that person, you think, uh, Daniel, in that situation? Well... I mean, considering that this is the same guy who went to our platoon commander. Bear in mind, here's an interesting fact for you. My platoon commander, his name was Captain Butcher. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. He committed suicide. He was the son of the England football manager, Terry Butcher. Wow, OK. Um, but, yeah, he actually went straight up to Captain Butcher and said, I don't respect you. And yeah. So there, so there are, so there are actually some people, Daniel, where even even the the very harshest military discipline doesn't bring them into line. It doesn't bring them into line, but it's sort of out of what we started with thirty two lads. Two of them left of their own accord because they just didn't want to do it anymore. The rest of you know, uh, he was the only one to get essentially booted out. Yeah. Because he wouldn't learn. So it's a you know, at a success rate, it does work. Okay. You may get okay. one bad egg, but it does usually work. Okay. Um Daniel, really interesting call. Thanks very much indeed. That's Daniel in Shropshire. Another WhatsApp voice note. This is from Roger on Water Companies. Let's listen to this. Hello Peter. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, my local water company is owned by the government. I only pay fourteen dollars a month which I reckon is excellent value. $14 a month, I'd be very happy to pay 14 I'd pay in any currency 14 Sorry, say again, Dave? £7.23, Dave has done the maths on that. £7.23 a month for water, I'd be very happy with that. Uh, Christopher is in the Midlands and has given me a call on water as well, 0344 499 1000. Uh, Christopher, hello there. What point would you like to make this afternoon? Well, it's just that um, I was just saying that these sports companies have already been paid to clear up the mess in the rivers. Yes, they have. Yes, they have. They shouldn't be given any more yeah, money. When they were started, when they actually took over. So well, I don't see why. I'd rather them all go to the wall and then the shareholders get nothing because they've had the noses in the trough for the last so many years now, for the last 25 years, 30 years. Is it the, is it the shareholder's fault or is it the management's fault, do you think, well, Chris? Well, well, it's the shareholder's fault and the management. I mean, the shareholders, I mean, they're buying up, and most of it's bought up by foreign companies anyway. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. The way, it's a thing that we cannot do without. So, yeah, yeah. So, know, you, I mean, so do you think, Christopher, it should be in public ownership then? Well, it should be, yeah, and I thought, I thought the Labour leader was supposed to was going to bring it back. But that's why I won't be voting Labour, because he said he, he flip-flops on everything, and even that, you know, said, are we going to bring the water companies back and all this and nationalise it? And now he's run the other way. OK, Christopher, thanks for your point. Really appreciate that. Christopher in the Midlands, give us a ring on 0344 499 1000. Uh, Adam has been in touch on text as well. He says, Peter, a question on uh, that non-hate crime incident. If I am in England and someone reports me, am I a wanted man in Scotland but free in England? Um, I'm not a legal expert, Adam, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know, um, actually. are you If you're reported in Scotland, how that works. Um, certainly there are, I mean, look, I, I think those things are very, very... Uh, not serious if it's a non-hate crime incident you're not going to be dragged across the border but certainly uh, there is cooperation between police services there are all sorts of uh, you know cross uh, cross border ideas certainly in terms of European arrest warrants if someone is wanted in in England but they're in France for example that's a that's an issue there and that's something that can be done uh, but of course we are one United Kingdom but different legal systems in Scotland and uh, England and Wales Andrew has been in touch he says I'm the guy who pays 15.99 a month for my water hello again Andrew. I have a water meter. I don't wash my car or water my garden. I don't, unlike today, I don't waste water uh, and I live 30 miles north of Cardiff. Well, Andrew, thank you 
for that and good for you for not wasting water although that can be quite difficult um i think it was jonathan ross who said that he only uh, actually takes a shower once every two weeks um i think his wife uh, is the same i think her name is jane something uh, not ross but something else and she says that she only has a shower once every two weeks um i i don't think i would necessarily advise that i must say i i'm generally a once a day guy sometimes twice a day in the in the summer when i get a bit bit sweaty anyway uh less said about that the better uh, we're going to get the chocolate sweats next because uh, tech up dave will be in the studio with the cheapest chocolate and the cheapest eggs and the most economical eggs in a cost of living crisis that he can find and perhaps some last minute tips if you haven't bought your nearest and dearest easter eggs tech up dave has the ones to buy he will be in the studio next here on talk tv Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. At 2.45 today, it is the boat race. Ian Anderson has been in touch today to say, anyone who is in today's boat race final? I know last year it was between Oxford and Cambridge. Um, <laughs> Ian, very good. I think we can safely assume that Oxford and Cambridge are in the boat race today. Um, so thank you very much indeed for that. Thanks also to Penny in Essex. I'll read hers out in a second. Phil in Oxford says, paying for water, it's madness. Evian spelt in reverse is naive. Never knew that. Uh, they're laughing at you, says Phil in Oxford. Um, I suppose it's, it's more about getting water to you and taking it from you than the actual water itself. But anyway, Penny and Ask says, Hi Peter, I'm more upset at no Happy Easter on so many eggs. I'm not religious, but it is, it is our culture. So many just have chocolate egg on it. Well, we'll take a look at that now with Tech Up Dave, actually. Uh, Penny in Essex has been in touch. We also have an NHS doctor saying, Don't eat an Easter egg in one go. Uh, doctor, what's his name? Um, doctor Andrew Kelso, I'm going to ignore you uh, on that. Um, Dave. You have to. Hello, sir. How are hello, you? Hello, hello. You don't uh, have to ignore him. I've come up with a workaround. You've come up, what's the workaround on eating a whole Easter egg in one go? 
uh, well, you just eat half of it and then you crack another one open and you eat the other half. The other half of that one and then give the other person, yeah, that's, I mean, in a court of law, you would win. Exactly. So Tech Up Dave is here. Now, you've been on the prowl. You've got your Easter egg hat on as yes. well with your bunny ears. Um, yeah, never want to take life too seriously. Um, but, but quite seriously, for a lot of people, Easter is a really expensive time. There are lots of expensive eggs out there costing an absolute fortune. We talked about shrink flesh and previously, and we talked about Easter eggs actually at that point that Penny makes. There's a shop that's omitted Easter from eggs advert. This is a Cadbury store that's been criticised by Christian campaigners after advertising Easter eggs as gesture eggs. Uh, the shop was in Spalding in Lincolnshire. It was promoting a two for £10 deal on the eggs when it omitted the reference to Easter. The Cadbury's owner said it has no involvement in the promotion and that the store is licensed to Fresh Stores Limited uh, and Fresh Stores was contacted to, for, for comment by the newspaper. I'm reading out for this, uh, the I. But they are definitely, definitely Easter eggs. No doubt about that. We wouldn't be having these eggs unless they were, uh, unless it was Easter. Um, no. But the question I want to ask you before I try any chocolate whatsoever is why can't you put cream eggs in your hand luggage? Well, this has come out this week and it's all down to the nice people at Heathrow and Bristol Airport. And you can't take a cream egg on a plane because it will break the liquid allowance that you're allowed is in your hand Is it because there's luggage. more than 100 millilitres of, cream of, of, of in liquid the... in a cream egg? Yes. <laughs> How nuts is that? Uh, well, it's not nuts, it's cream egg. Exactly. Um, both airports added that cream eggs may be confiscated as they could breach the rules when carrying liquid to their filling. Bristol Airport even says security staff may remove chocolate eggs from their packaging to be inspected. Yeah, we know why that is. We know Sorry, how it, uh, unfortunately, you can't bring these on. Uh, what do you want to do with Oh, we'll just discard that egg. Nom, nom, nom. nom, 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 nom. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sorry you can't take that egg on board. We'll have to confiscate it. Nom, 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 nom. Exactly. Advice from Bristol Airport. If travelling with Easter eggs, passengers are advised to keep any chocolate treats in your cabin baggage and to make sure they're easily accessible as they may need to be opened for a quick check. Oh, it's nonsense. Anyway, tell me about the Easter eggs you found because, actually, no, we'll go to Shane first. Oh. Shane Williams has said, yes. uh, G'day, Pete, you mentioned cream eggs. It's Saturday night, he's in Australia. Uh, that's why I'm saying g'day. I've had a couple of cream eggs and a few beers. It doesn't go down too well. Happy Easter to you and Jack, says uh, Shane. Well, happy Easter to you, Shane. It'll be, I, I would imagine it'll be Easter with you now with the time difference. So it'll be Easter Sunday or Easter Day, as some people call it. Um, so um, I, let's just call it Easter Sunday. But yeah, cream eggs and beer. I'm not sure what, that's no, the, necessarily that's, the best combination. That's not going to go well, is it? No, it's not. No. Um, Dan and Kent says, been looking forward to the next feature. I know it's going to be excellent. Um, yes, there we are. Um, uh, Terry in Birmingham says, Hi Peter, if Liz Truss was likened to a lettuce, so should Rishi Sunak a wet one, time for him to go. Um, that's not about Easter eggs, but thank you very much anyway, Terry in Birmingham. So, I mean, we've got quite a few here. We've got Little, Aldi, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Poundland, Home Bargains and B&M. You, you went around quite a lot. You took your assignment very seriously. I did. Dave, I, and thank you for doing so. I thought it was the only way to do this. Don't do it half-hearted and we can probably eat them all at a later date. I, I, um, I think we probably can. I, I, I will volunteer to help you. I will Excellent. make sure you're not left alone on that. You've got some pretty sort of normal, straightforward ones. You've got a got, dinosaur Smarties yeah, one. Yeah, Smarties one. Kit, Kit Kat, Kat one. There. They're There's... about three quid, the Kit Kat ones, if you're looking around. OK. Tesco's so that... are flogging those at about three quid. That's not too bad. And Sainsbury's are selling them for about £3.25. OK. So... But they seem to be dropping prices because they want to get them out. Of so, course. The best I mean, time to buy Easter eggs is, of course, Easter Monday, when yes. they really want rid of them. Or buy them on Boxing Day when they start selling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. And, what, and there's some with toys as well. You've got from Aldi there. Uh, there's one from Aldi here which has a, a, a small dinosaur with it. Yes. Uh, you can also get a one with a mermaid or a hedgehog. OK, that's, and that's Dino the Dinosaur. Danny the Dino. Yes, and that comes in at four ninety nine. OK, so you get the, the toy so get as the well. Toy so that's good for a younger the, child. Yes, what is the quality of the chocolate, though? Should we try that um, one? I don't know, should we try Yeah, let's try that okay, one. We'll so that, this is the out. Aldi one. This is Dairy Fine Egg and Dino. You can also have a hedgehog or a mermaid, as, as Dave said. That's 4 99 So you've got an egg and a little soft toy as well. Yes. Um, so we're going to give this chocolate a bit of a try and see if it's any good. Give it a give it a smash there. There we go, on yeah, the desk. Yeah. Sorry. We're all, no, we're always telling uh, we're always telling our guests not to sort of tap the desk because if they do that near the microphone, you can kind of hear it and the vibrations are there. But let's try. Um, it has come in in uh, hasn't really broken. Useful. It's, it's broken a bit. It's broken enough. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. Try that one. This is the Aldi one. I think our chocolate's okay. Actually, it's nice. I haven't tried it yet. Well, I'll give it a go. I, I was always told not to eat with me mouth or not to talk. Talk with, with your mouth full. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid I just just clearly uh, didn't get that advice. Um, but. 
I mean, yeah, I, I think that's okay. That's it's nice. not the nicest chocolate I've ever tasted, but it's, it's fine. Okay. Um, let's try another one of the bargain ones. Uh, what would you recommend? Maybe okay. from Aldi or Little or something well, like that? Well, if you went really, really... The cheapest way of doing this is either go and buy a tiny Freddo one, mm -hmm. which comes in with lots of little Freddo heads, yes. and they are £1.50. Okay. So that's fairly cheap. Or, if you want it really, really cheap, buy a big bag of mini eggs. Because that's good value, isn't it? There's eight packets in this bag. Oh, there are eight packets of mini eggs. And it eggs. was only a fiver. So but it's also got... not an Easter egg, and if you have a child, they'll, they're going to yeah. want an Easter egg, aren't they? That's true. So, uh, if you wander off to Lidl, this is where we get fired by Phil Dave, by the way. Oh, right, OK. Because I found a fudge biscuit blast. Oh, 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 it's biscuit-related. So it's biscuit-related. Sorry, sorry, so, we can't talk about that so uh, do you at all. crack that one? No, no, we can't, well, I'm afraid we just can't talk about that because it's, it's biscuit-related and yes. uh, Phil Phil will be and that unhappy. Was, that uh, was £3.50, that one. Just the reference, obviously, is to Phil Dave there, who's our weekend editor on Enemy of Fun. Yes. Um, so he, he, he killed the biscuit breakdown. Um, so I got a biscuit egg. So we got a biscuit egg there. Seems so. Yeah, no, he didn't kill Cat of the Week. No, he didn't kill Cat of the Week, uh, Chris. That was a decision. That was a mutual decision. We did a hundred of them. Anyway, um, right, we're going to do... Um, we're going to do this. Now, this so is that's interesting a because... fudge biscuit blast. So you can also is, get a is... white chocolate with mini egg egg. OK, so I'm holding it up to the camera, but for people who are listening on the radio, this has got biscuit in it, it's got fudge, it's got white chocolate. It's sort of inlaid in the actual egg itself. Egg itself. And if you break it, like that... <laughs> It'll all, it'll all come apart. It's all over the place. It's all over the desk here. Um, we have it. I didn't think it would actually disintegrate to this it's exploded this sort of degree, but well all, all of this has, has disintegrated. I'm just going to have to eat that now, Dave. Well, yes. And this so, is the Mr. Chalk one. Where is this from? That came from Lidl, that one. Yeah, excellent. Well, I'll try a little bit of it. That's delicious. Now, I have the Aldi cookies and cream milk chocolate egg which is a similar similar so the, even even for reasonable amounts of money this so was 350 as well okay i mean this is this is not we're not breaking the bank with these obviously for three or four kids or whatever it's going to be it's going to get expensive for lots of grandchildren yeah but really you can get creative and different eggs for for not a huge amount of money oh this is clever What's going on here? This one's got a flat bottom. Ah, that's so clever. So you can stand it up. I would stand it up. Oh, I suppose I could balance yeah. it there. Oh, no. So, yes. No, that's very good. Actually. So that, that's 350 as well. Do you want to try a bit of this one? Um, I'm kind of enjoying this one, to be honest. Oh, right. Okay. It. Uh, I, I might try this one, then. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. Gas has arrived. Deanna Davidson has... She's meant to come in in a couple of minutes' time, but we really, really appreciate the fact that you've come early. Uh, Deanna, well, that's, that's very decent I, of you. I thought it was my moral duty mm. to be here to try this colossal bag of mini eggs. Would you like to try a bit of Aldi cookies and cream? Of course I would, yeah. I haven't tried that. What do you mean? That's I'm, quite thick, actually. Yours one doesn't You're look pointing at an MP saying that's quite that's thick. <laughs> <laughs> I meant Not the, the first end. time it's been said, Peter. <laughs> that's pretty good. Try try the... Um, what about the... Yeah, try a little bit of this. What about the... What is this? this? This is the one. Where was this one? That from? one's from Lidl. That yeah, one. it's being presented to me on your... On, on my, my printouts. Yeah. Uh, on my I'd notes. like to apologise. He did smash it on the desk and it exploded. <laughs> Stop flinching. There we go. There we go. I think it's delicious. It's got What's fudge that? and everything mm. in it. That's a fudge biscuit one, but we can't mention the biscuits. That is really good, though. Is it? Oh. Mm. I'm a big fan. I mean, you've a lot Very of chocolate sweet. there. Dave, you really took this mission mm. quite seriously. What, from all you've all you've eaten, what's your favourite one? I don't know. All of them. <laughs> all of them. So I, I, re I refer you back to the, the how we started this. Don't eat a whole egg. Yep. Eat half of one and then crack another one open and eat the That's other very half. Wise. Dave, I'm sorry, I'm dropping chocolate all over the floor in That's the studio right. here. But very, um, very good. Um, well, listen, apart from the dropping of the chocolate, um, Deanna, what is in your show? Many Between things. one and four. Uh, she's just finishing a little bit Many of Easter things. egg there. Um, finishing a little bit of Easter egg. We'll leave you some of this for your show as well. So I in the appreciate break, that. Can, yeah. I'm not sure I'll make it through three hours if all I'm doing is getting on a sugar high. If you're in a diabetic coma, yeah. Absolutely. Um, lots of stuff. So we've got Benedict Spence joining us for the first hour to go through some of the stories of the week. We're going to be talking about Jeffrey Donaldson's mm -hmm. resignation, mm -hmm. which I know you've just covered on your show, but getting into kind of what that means for the future of, of the DUP and indeed mm -hmm. for the future of Northern Ireland. Um, we are going to be talking about... The Angela Rayner saga, mm -hmm. not necessarily specifically on that issue, but should politicians more broadly publish their tax return? Should they be publishing Would you publish your advice? tax return? I don't personally think there is a need to because every extra income I earn is declared on my declaration of interest as it is. So I yeah. don't think it actually adds anything by way of transparency. I'm quite anti that. Mm -hmm. Not because I don't believe in transparency, but because there are already mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But we'll see what Benedict's kind of point of view is on that. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to be talking about one that I find 
interesting if a challenging one which is the assisted dying debate in scotland yeah. and the new legislation that's just been introduced very very interesting scotland mm. in, in general 